3月11日、えー、トリフジポイント今日は、えー、波の方は腰から腹あるかないかぐらいで今はまだ朝のうちなんで風も弱くて目も綺麗でまあ全然サーフィンできるコンディションです。漏れてきてるここやばいやばい気をつけてそこまだ揺れてるよOn March 11, 2011, the nation of Japan was devastated by a magnitude 9.0 earthquake and tsunami. 650 kilometers of the Japanese coastline was flooded, and the number of confirmed deaths is over 19,000 as of December 2021, and more than 2,500 people are still reported missing. With a magnitude of 9.0, it was the most powerful earthquake ever recorded in Japan. The initial shock waves radiating outwards from the earth traveled at 6 kilometers per second, and although Japan's detection systems picked up the shockwaves almost immediately and automatic warnings were sent out across the country, as soon as people received alerts, the coastal cities had already begun to shake. The first of which being Sendai, just 130 kilometers from where the earthquake originated, and the tsunami waves would hit the coast within minutes. Over the next 72 hours, the coastline of Japan would be devastated by the ensuing waves, some reaching 23 feet in height, and flooding debris across mainland Japan, wiping out entire towns and communities. The tsunami had also caused the nuclear meltdown at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant in Okuma, just south of Sendai. This would be one of the biggest nuclear disasters in history. In the months and years following this tragedy, the nation of Japan would enter a period of grief, followed by restoration, with hope in their hearts setting out to rebuild and restore the unforgettable damage done to the people of Japan and their country. In August 2021, the eighth part of JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, Jojolian, concluded its decade-long serialization in Seinen Ultra Jump magazine at chapter 110, making it the longest part of JoJo to date, spanning 27 volumes and consisting of over 4,700 pages, which makes up just about 20% of the entire series. This part tells the story of an alternate Morio, a fictional town based on the author Hirohiko Araki's hometown of Sendai, with new mysteries to uncover as well as a new evil lurking within in the city streets, following the story of a man who came from the ground with no name or memories, trying to find his identity and purpose in the world. <laughs> Jojolian was written and illustrated by Hirohiko Araki, dedicating 10 years of his life to this story, its characters, and its art. And while that may sound like a grueling commitment in terms of the workload as a manga artist, in the case of Araki, as he's expressed many times, manga is his life. It's his fuel and passion and what keeps him young at heart and full of curiosity. It's through this work he's able to express his ideas and emotions with art, by telling these stories of overcoming conflict and personal growth. Araki had reached the age of 61 by the end of Jojolian 
Napoleon and is currently 62 and will be continuing JoJo's Bizarre Adventure in a ninth part, The JoJo Lands, in February of 2023. And despite his age, he continues to indulge his vocation in good health for himself and his readers. So for that, I would first like to wholeheartedly thank Araki Sensei for his work and giving millions of people around the world memories and lessons to lead better lives and passing those ideas on to future generations to celebrate the beauty of humanity, which is the ultimate theme of JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. I personally have a strong connection and nostalgia for JoJo Land, having been reading and reviewing the manga for over five years, anticipating and discussing the story's every development to an almost exhausting extent. It's now been about a year and a half since JoJo Land ended, and I've taken that time to reflect on the part as well as step away from it for a while, to see how my opinions and perspective have changed by revisiting the story after leaving it out of my mind for several months, potentially viewing the characters and its story in a new light. So as a sort of addendum to my series of JoJo Land reviews, this is my complete review and retrospective of JoJo's Bizarre Adventure Part 8, JoJo Land. Starting from the beginning, the story of Jojolian begins pre-serialization, as it's a direct sequel to Steel Ball Run, continuing the story of Jojo's alternate world. This world shift in Part 7 was Araki's answer to the end of Stone Ocean, that definitively concluded the Joestar bloodline which was never meant to continue after that point, or at least in the same world. So the answer to the question, where do we go from here, was a pseudo-reboot of the series, keeping its themes, aesthetics, structure, and even characters to some extent, but without any restrictions from its previous 25 years of history, a completely fresh start for the story and Araki's creativity, while still technically being a continuation of the original story, all contained under the same title, JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. Over the course of Steel Ball Run's eight-year-long serialization, we would see many callbacks and reimagining of beloved characters from JoJo, including Jonathan Joestar, the Zeppeli family, Dio Brando, and many others, one of which being a Higashikata, Norisuke Higashikata the first, who is a mysterious Japanese participant in the Steel Ball Run race sharing a surname with Josuke Higashikata from Part 4, alluding to the existence of more Japanese characters from the original universe, as well as the alternate version of Morio. While this may have seemed like a simple callback at the time, Araki was in fact setting up for Jojo Lian as early as Part 7 itself, having some sort of an idea for how the two parts would connect and possibly even Part 9, the Jojo Lands. Looking back at previous Araki interviews before Part 8 began, he would claim he has an idea for the future and would specifically allude to returning to Morio. In the January issue of Jump Square Magazine in 2008, in response to a statement on Part 4's realistic setting, Araki had said, You get the feeling that the town of Morio actually exists. Part 4 had to end because Kira was gone, but I really want to draw more. I want to put something else in that town, so maybe I will draw it again someday, in Part 8 and 9. So considering Jojolin would begin just four years later and Araki had already begun planting the seeds throughout Steel Ball Run, it's clear he knew he would be returning to Morio, and leading up to Part 8 was dropping hints throughout his story and interviews, playfully alluding to more callbacks in the future of fan-favorite characters and locations. Jojolin would begin its serialization in May 2011, following the final chapter of Steel Ball Run just one month prior, as Araki had taken no hiatus or break in between parts. The first official announcement for Jojolin, as well as first look at the new Jojo, was 
within the same release as Steel Ball Run's final chapter, the April issue of Ultra Jump 2011, where we see who would later be known as Josuke, as well as a glimpse of his stand, soft and wet, with a familiar residential district in the background. The only details provided at the time were the part's name, and that it would be set in the town of Morio, which shows just how important the setting is to fans of Jojo, but also to Araki, as Morio is based on Araki's hometown of Sendai, Japan. So in a way, this may have felt like returning home after a long trip, but certainly provided familiarity to both Araki and the readers. The excitement to see Morio reimagined within this alternate universe really piqued readers' curiosity, as Steel Ball Run was fundamentally a retelling of Phantom Blood, revisiting many of the same characters and plot points, so people could only expect the same for Part 8, bringing back the characters and tone of Diamond is Unbreakable, which introduced more slice of life and mystery elements into the stand battle formula, and these qualities would return in Jojolian, starting with the first and biggest mystery about this part, who is the new Jojo? The introduction of Josuke and Jojolian was a completely new approach compared to previous parts. In the past, it would seem Araki had a sort of checklist when it came to introducing a new protagonist, trying to give as much information as possible while still feeling natural by putting the character in a situation that would allow them to show the kind of person they are as well as their capabilities. So by the end of the first chapter or so, we would already have some sort of an idea for who our new Jojo is. Meanwhile, in Jojolian, the introduction of Josuke does this, but in a complete opposite approach as what Araki tells us is that we don't know anything about this character and neither does himself, as Josuke begins as a blank slate. He doesn't know his name or have any memories, therefore we can't determine the kind of person he is from this first interaction. But this lack of information for the protagonist works in Jojolian because Josuke's identity is an extension of the plot, which was a new way of storytelling for the series. As in the past, character motivations could often be categorized as reactive and proactive. For example, Jonathan, Joseph, and Jotaro were all forced to react to their unfortunate circumstances, or some world-shattering event entering their lives. Meanwhile, characters like Giorno and Johnny actively pursued their ambitions, in pursuit of making the world a better place or to achieve personal growth. Meanwhile, in Jojolian, Josuke doesn't necessarily fit into either of those categories, or at least in the beginning of the part, as the plot is driven by simply his existence, a man who emerged from the ground and wants to remember who he is and where he belongs, being carried by a certain flow more than his own personal interest as he doesn't really have much of a choice in the matter of discovering who he is. Alongside the introduction of Josuke, right in the beginning of the story is also the introduction of Morio happening simultaneously, as we see a new but familiar Morio, which is in a state of grief and reconstruction after the effects of the Great Earthquake of 311, which occurred a few months before the start of the story, in both real life and the manga. This distorted version of Morio may have not been what Araki planned for when he thought of returning to the once peaceful and quiet town, but after the earthquake of 311, Araki may have felt this national tragedy was an important event to depict in his work and give himself and readers a message of hope in the wake of such a calamity, as well as to keep the vision of Morio with that of Sendai, sharing the memories of childhood and beauty but also the tragedies, maintaining a balance of light and dark within the fiction, which works to express the predominant theme of the alternate universe, the ever-persistent effects of the positive and negative flows, which will be a much larger discussion throughout the course of this retrospective. As in contrast to Steel Ball Run, which is a story about revival and miracles and the positive forces within the world, Jojolian is fundamentally a story about calamity and how people can endure and overcome the unexpected disasters we are all bound to face throughout our lives, focusing heavily on the negative forces within the world. As stated in the first chapter, this is a story about breaking a curse, which we will later see manifest in many ways throughout the story, one of which being a disease which affects the Higashikata family, turning their firstborn child's skin to stone, a calamity which each generation generation must face. Even within the first chapter, we can see the presence of Calamity through Araki's depiction of the 311 earthquake. In Jojolian, the Tohoku earthquake is a plot point and central theme of its story. It's no coincidence Araki chose to write a story about a man who lost his identity and sense of self as a result of an earthquake, which also occurred on March 11th, 2011 within the story. Josuke's amnesia is a metaphor for the very real anxieties and stress felt by the nation of Japan following this tragedy, reminding the Japanese people that one one day, Japan may not exist, and the people could lose their homeland. If that were to happen, what does it mean to be Japanese? Being a culture that is so connected to their geographical location, one may also lose their sense of self. With no homeland, there is no sense of belonging, a true loss of identity and culture. Who am I? 
Where am I? And Jojolian is in a way a story created to give solace and hope following the national tragedy of 311, to move forward and rebuild after such a calamity. Josuke's character in many ways expresses this theme of hope as he is literally created through the broken pieces of the earthquake and is referred to multiple times as a miracle. And in the aftermath, strives to rebuild, find his sense of belonging in the world and go beyond calamity itself. Which is a message I could only assume a Japanese person may want to express after being so heavily affected by the earthquake. So while the earthquake itself is mentioned sparsely by the characters, we can see the effects of it throughout the entire story, and it's the ever-present reminder of calamity. So consider this a foreword and introduction to Jojolian, as with a basic understanding of the part's theme, we can now begin further discussing the context of the manga, its characters, story, setting, and minor themes. I will be discussing nearly every story arc and character within Jojolian, although some may be elaborated on further than others, but generally this will be all-encompassing. Insane. Jojolian begins through the perspective of Yasuo Hirose, a fairly normal college student who quickly becomes a predominant ally and love interest to the protagonist Josuke, and uses this experience throughout the part to become a stronger person and overcome past traumas. She is also the alternate equivalent of Koichi Hirose from part 4. Yasuo acts as a narrator, as if she is telling us the story of Jojolian years later, introducing us to the main character, setting, plot, occasionally filling in the details in between gaps in time, and by the end of the story, tells the audience what it all means in the end, and how hope prevails in even the worst of calamities. The story begins with Yasuo discovering a man emerging from the ground, with no name or memories. Being the person who finds Josuke, Yasuo feels a sort of responsibility for him, as much of the early part is the two working together to uncover the mystery behind Josuke's identity, and through their adventures and helping each other through adversity, they quickly develop feelings for one another. Josuke cherishing his precious memories of the first person he had ever met, and Yasuo cherishing the void Josuke was able to fill in her life. Life, providing her with a purpose and someone who sees her as if she is the most important person in the whole world. While I wouldn't say the romance elements were a huge part of Jojolian, it was something new and experimental for Araki, besides Arino way back in part 1, to give the protagonist a direct love interest that would develop over the course of the part and also serve as their main supporting ally. Although for how predominant their feelings were for one another in the first half of the part, I have to say that I never felt as if their relationship came to a satisfying resolution, as by the end of the part we never even see a kiss between the two or them tell each other how they feel. And while I understand Jojolene isn't a shoujo manga, I would rather have had their relationship defined by the end of the story than feeling more like their romance took a backseat in the second half and never came to a resolution. As in the final chapters, the time we do see the two spend together is spent tying up loose ends for the readers more so than for the characters, and in the final pages, while it is ultimately a happy ending, it ends with Yasuo walking away from Josuke, leaving him with his new family, a group she doesn't feel like she belongs with. So while I'm sure Araki didn't intend for this to be interpreted as Josuke not caring about Yasuo as he's with his new family, I would have just liked something to conclude the arc of their romance that had been built up for a majority of the part, as Araki specifically made Yasuo a female character for the purpose of their romance. Writing in his book, Manga in Theory and Practice, take Yasuo Hirose from Jojo's 8th arc, Jojolian, whom I made a variation of Koichi from the 4th arc, Diamond is Unbreakable. Koichi represented friendship, but I wanted to add more romance to Jojolian, so I made the character a woman. I included many other other female characters in Jojolian, but that was because I wanted to include elements of eroticism. I thought that with the relationship between the protagonist Josuke and Yasuo, I wouldn't be able to avoid such scenes, referring to romantic writing and depictions between the two. And I also wanted to challenge myself by attempting elements from genres I haven't done yet for Shonen Jump. So if this was Araki's intention, I wouldn't say he was very successful in exploring new genres through their relationship, as the most romance we get is usually expressed through their eyes and in the actions they take to protect each other as rarely do they speak about their emotions or interact physically. And by the end of the story, their romance is pretty much non-existent, only expressed through their desire to save each other and except for the fact that their hearts seem to be connected in some way as they can use their stands together. But this is all still more associated with the action side of the part's genre. I understand you can't really write romance in the middle of a stand fight, but there are plenty of opportunities before and after Wonder of You to at least give these two a kiss. But coming back to the beginning of the story, when Josuke is pulled from the ground, he saves Yasuo from Jojo 
Yoshu Higashikata, a creepy obsessive friend who is implied to have been following Yasuo, and is enraged when he sees Yasuo with another man, so he attacks the two, shoving Yasuo to the ground, which causes a protective instinct within Josuke and awakens his stand ability, as we see a soap bubble emerge from his Joestar birthmark, which has the ability to plunder, stealing away properties from whatever they touch, stealing away Joshu's eyesight temporarily. This first chapter introduces many mysteries that will be focuses on the plot moving forward, the first of which being Josuke's identity, his four balls, and how he somehow has a Joestar birthmark, as we know he must be a descendant of Johnny Joestar in some way. Secondarily are the walleyes, which Yasuo explains are these protrusions that mysteriously rose from the ground on the day of the Great Earthquake, as well as there are the bite marks that are found around Josuke's birthmark. The walleyes were one of the great mysteries in Jojolian, all the way up to the final chapters, with readers demanding for a further explanation behind the phenomenon, and some even claiming Araki forgot about them, even though they were drawn consistently throughout the entire part. So although we never received a cut and dry explanation for what the walleyes are or what caused them, we do see later events in the story that give us clues into their true nature, which can bring us to a pretty definitive resolution with all things considered. The walleyes have an undeniable connection to the Devil's Palm from part seven, as when Jesus died on the Western continent of North America, a great storm and earthquake tore and reshaped the land, which divided his corpse into nine parts. Over the course of almost two millennia, said parts would be carried by animals and other forces of nature eastwards across the continent. While originally the Devil's Palm was created by an asteroid, the corpse parts seemingly began to form the Devil's Palm around themselves, using the palms to move themselves further across the land and for protection, as they would rise from the ground around corpse parts like a hand that's trying to hold on to them. So the walleyes, while not directly being a Devil's Palm, there are undeniable connections and similarities. Firstly, they look very similar and are categorized by Araki as supernatural phenomena that grant powers, along with the stone mask and stand arrows referred to as Blessings from the Earth in chapter 99 of Jojolian. While there is much more to unearth when it comes to the walleyes, I will have to hold off on the larger discussion until the legend of Johnny Joestar for further context on the topic. But as for the mystery that becomes less relevant as the story goes on, I will address the phenomenon of the bite marks. The bite marks similarly to the walleyes have been a plot point and motif that have been theorized and discussed about for the entirety of the part, even up until the final chapter. Fans waited and waited for years for Iraqi to give an answer to these mysterious marks marks in a definitive way. Readers wanted to see what it was that actually bit Josuke, Yasuo, and Joshu, be it a stand, animal, or human. But as we know, by the end of Jojolian, the bite marks were never addressed again since the beginning of the part and the various times they were seen after that, and people were disappointed. I think people focused a bit too much on this plot point when it was not much of a plot point to begin with, especially nearing the end of the part. As it stands, these bite marks were simply a visual indication that someone had been affected by the blessed lands of Morio. Think of the fault lines as a double palm from Steel Ball Run, as just being within the area can create a cursed one or stand user. Josuke had gotten his bite marks as he was buried there, as well as because the two people who make up Josuke were both stand users, but soft and wet is something entirely new. The other characters with bite marks were Yasuo and Joshu, who were also in the area of the walleyes. Although we know that Yasuo has had her stand since she was a kid, and most of the Higashikata family members are naturally stand users, although this may be because of where they live, so close to the blessed lands of Morio. So it seems that the bite marks do not grant stand abilities, rather they awaken dormant stands. The first minor villain Ojiro had also obtained his stand from the blessed lands, but without any bite marks, or at least to our knowledge. It's also an important detail to distinguish that the bite marks do not appear instantly, as Yasuo had noticed her marks developing over time. It is a bit confusing that Araki chose bite marks, but they are more of a side effect of the blessed lands, like a rash or an allergic reaction caused by the area. I don't believe Araki had ever intended on showing who or what actually bit these characters. Again, it's more of a reaction that just so happens to look like a bite, because none of the characters felt anything or were ever aware that they were bitten. The bite markings also appear similar to the gaps in the walleyes that look like faces, associating them in some way. So even if something was biting the characters, it would be more like a stand-like supernatural phenomenon without a physical form, like the other supernatural things from Morio in the original universe, like the ghost alley. It is entirely possible that Araki had something planned for the bite marks that was dropped along the way, as although they do appear when being around the blessed lands of Morio, they aren't exactly connected, as Ojiro and Daya Higashikata had obtained stands through the blessed lands, but never mentioned any bite marks or had any scars. So seemingly, the bite marks only started appearing after Kira Yoshikage died underground on the blessed lands. As for some reason during his autopsy, it's mentioned that Kira's body also had bite marks on it, although the bite marks matched his own teeth. So possibly a side effect of Kira's death caused his teeth marks to appear on people close to his body, which were Josuke, Yasuo, and Joshu, standing right on top of it in the first chapter. But as it stands, that's as much of a conclusion we can draw from the subject as possible, 
as it was never elaborated on further or mentioned by the characters later on. I really think the only defining trait of the bite marks that is consistent is that they awaken dormant stand abilities. As the three characters with bite marks either already were or were always going to be stand users, it just so happens that their stands awakened shortly after they appeared. But coming back to the story, we have the first real arc of the part, which is the mystery of Kira Yoshikage. The first half of Jojo Land has a particularly excellent flow to its plot because as I mentioned previously, the character motivation and plot are one and the same. Its mysterious nature keeps you hooked from chapter to chapter as we learn more about the true nature of this new Jojo and his identity. As the plot builds like a jigsaw puzzle slowly revealing the bigger picture in the ensuing arcs. Following Josuke's fight with Joshu, he is hospitalized for a few days and meets back up with Yasuo after she comes to check up on the two. We see a slight glimpse into Josuke's knowledge of the world as though he lacks his memories, he's not completely lost, similar to an amnesia victim. He knows language and what words mean, just nothing about himself or their past. Although he seems to have a disconnect for how humans work, as when he sees a child, he calls them a little person and wonders to himself if he is also going to get bigger. And there's just a lot of weird quirks with Josuke's character, at least in the first few chapters of the part. Like his abnormal habit of measuring things with his eyes, measuring the length of birds outside, the distance between them, and Yasuo's height. Although Josuke doesn't really keep up with this habit later on in the story, as it really only serves the purpose to draw a connection between him and a character who will be introduced later on, that connects another piece to the puzzle. So Josuke and Yasuo begin their investigation by going to where the clothes are made that Josuke is wearing, the SBR hat shop, which is the first reference to Steel Ball Run in the part, and in the background of the shop we have further references to previous parts, as we can see Jotaro and Emporio's hats, as well as Johnny and Gyro's. The shop owner claims that he had sold the hat to Josuke no more than three days ago, and this brings us to the first big reveal, and it's that Josuke is identified as Kira Yoshikage, a name synonymous with Morio from part four, that fans were certainly expecting to see from part eight, just maybe not this early. And I just think it's super clever for Araki to use the name Kira in this identity as a part of Josuke's past and this early in the mystery. As if it was just some random other character, we might not be as interested in Josuke's identity or the mystery behind him. But now that we know that he is associated with Kira in some way, with our knowledge from previous parts, this just makes every development in the story that much more interesting. This leads Josuke and Yasuo to Kira's apartment, and on the way, we see how Josuke gets his name, as he is given the name by Yasuo, as he reminds her of her old family dog, as well as she says he looks more like a Josuke than a Kira, as the name Josuke contains the kanji of the meaning determine and help, while Kira literally means killer. Upon arriving at Kira's apartment, fans are bombarded with references and red herrings associated with Kira Yoshikage from part four, with the Mona Lisa hanging on the wall next to a hand sculpture, and after exploring further, Josuke finds a cabinet full of fingernail clippings dated by month and year, as well as a woman trapped in his bathtub with a photograph book containing images of her being tied down. Thus ensues the first stand battle of the part, as Josuke and the women begin losing control of their limbs one by one, as they are afflicted with various wounds from the traps hidden around the apartment. This fight lasts for a few chapters, until Josuke finds the user, located above them, and is able to flush him out using soft and wet. Although during this fight is another notorious plot point which was left unaddressed by the end of the part, being the Flashback Man. At one point in this fight, when Josuke is hard of breathing, he has a sudden flashback of himself, or possibly Kira, looking up at a man. All Josuke knows is that this was definitely a missing memory, and he feels like he's seen this man's face before. Although the man from this memory would never be seen or mentioned again throughout the entire part. The leading theories behind this scene is that this flashback man was an early design of a villain that would appear later in the part, belonging to the Damo group, and that this was a memory of Kira before he died, sort of foreshadowing the events that happened before Josuke emerged from the ground. Although this man from the flashback doesn't look even remotely close to any member of the Damo group, as well as Josuke would never remember a missing memory again, which sort of acts as the theory. So while fans held their breath on this man all the way until the final chapter, I think this is one of the most clear examples of Araki changing his mind on a plot point, which if you haven't noticed the trend already, Araki tends to do that nearing the beginning of parts. So unless somehow this man returns in the Jojo lands and was a future memory of Josuke he experienced somehow, maybe a stand which is able to implant memories into someone's past or something. Other than that, I wouldn't worry too much about the flashback man appearing in the future and probably just leave it as a drop plot point. As it eventually becomes clear that Josuke is not an amnesia victim and he doesn't have missing memories. He simply just doesn't have any before he met Yasuo, as he is his own person regardless of how he came into creation and isn't tied to the fates or memories of those who brought him into life. So the idea of Josuke slowly remembering pieces of his past fundamentally goes against his character, which is most likely why this was dropped from the story and never addressed again. But I just love the dedication of some JoJo fans and the reluctancy to drop the scene, as when the first images of the JoJo Lens protagonist were shown, one of 
the first things I saw were people saying he looked like the flashback man and already making connections. So it looks like people will still be awaiting his return in part nine. But back in part eight, as this first fight continues, we are introduced to the stand user Ojiro Sasume, a man from Kira's past who planned to attack him in his home, but mistook Josuke for Kira. Ojiro is able to reveal many truths about Kira and push the plot forward in a substantial way, as he confirms that while Josuke does look like Kira and they are wearing the same clothes, he isn't him at all and reveals a picture of what Kira actually looked like. This scene also recontextualizes the assumptions Araki was having us make about this alternate Kira, sort of a bait and switch, alluding to the fact that Kira is also a killer and lived a similar life to original Kira, although the hands around his apartment were actually molds of Kira's own hands, and that the woman and pictures in his apartment were all the work of Ojiro, and Kira, as far as we know, isn't a serial killer in part 8. Although Ojiro, when telling Josuke about the man Kira was, he does say that when I heard him talk quietly, for some reason I just thought, that somewhere that man was committing murder. This is most likely just referencing Kira from part four as technically somewhere he was committing murder, just being an alternate universe. So although part eight Kira isn't evil like part four, they do have similar personalities as part eight Kira in some instances does lack empathy and is cold and very serious and even tormented Ojiro to the point of nearly insanity. So just having that same creepy and malicious undertones as Kira from part four. So with the photograph of Kira, Josuke and Yasuo go to the location in the photo, which is where Josuke was first found, and they discover Kira's corpse also underground. Following his autopsy, it's discovered that he had no external wounds or cause of death, although his balls were missing. But they weren't cut off or removed, just gone, like they were erased out of existence. This arc then ends with the introduction of the Higashikata family, as Yasuo tells us that because of Josuke's unique situation of having no social identity, he wasn't able to be accepted into any living facilities. So someone came forth to give him security, being the father of Joshu, inviting Josuke into their home and welcomed him as part of their family, now being Josuke Higashikata. And thus concludes the sort of prologue to Jojolian, which sets up a decent understanding of Josuke's character, as well as a start to the puzzle. As from what we know so far, is that Josuke is in some way Kira Yoshikage, or at least half Kira. As Ojiro had mentioned, somehow, it's like you're half alike to him, as well as for some reason he has taken Kira's balls. So if Josuke is half Kira, what we need to find next is more about Kira, who else is inside Josuke, and how this happened. Which so far is a pretty damn good mystery and an entirely new approach to a character in JoJo, reaching new heights in the bizarre aspect while still being intriguing. I'll probably say this again in this video, but the first half of JoJolian is hands down the best JoJo has ever been in terms of its writing, and how the plot constantly flows from one reveal to the next, building towards the truth of Josuke's identity. At the Higashikata estate, after a short time skip, Norisuke Higashikata, an eccentric single father, introduces Josuke to the family, and tells him a bit about their history, connecting the timeline all the way back to Norisuke the first, who we had met in Steel Ball Run, coming in second place by the end of the race. With the prize money, the first generation Norisuke returned to Japan and created a successful business importing foreign fruit, and every generation since then has inherited the practice, owning and operating the Higashikata Fruit Parlor in downtown Morio. A practice Norisuke the fourth holds very near and dear to his heart, having a certain passion for his duty. As for the rest of the family, there is the younger son Joshu, who we met in the first chapter, the eldest daughter Hato, the younger daughter Daya, grandchild Tsurugi, and the wife of the eldest son Mitsuba, and the maid Kei Nijimura, and the eldest son Jobin, who will appear later in the story. The Higashikata children often act very mature to one another despite their age, having little respect for each other and sometimes even whining like spoiled brats. They all live in the same home and seem to have had fairly easy lives coming from a wealthy family in a powerful position in Morio, allowing them each to live their lives at leisure and pursue whatever their ambitions desire, like Hato's modeling career and Joshu being able to afford to study at university and all can live at home comfortably. And this luxurious lifestyle and lack of responsibility can be seen through most of the children's personalities, through traits like naivety, greed, immaturity, and an unawareness to consequences of one's actions. At first, the family is set up in an almost unsettling dynamic, as Norisuke is suspiciously kind to Josuke and welcoming of him for no real reason, while also being surprisingly malicious towards him behind his back, as if Josuke is being led into a trap. As it seems Norisuke is somewhat aware of Josuke's identity and needs to ensure he stays under his control, as he gives Josuke Joshu's room, kicking Joshu out into the loft above the garage, and pays off his own son to go along with it, almost like things need to go smoothly. 
eventually. As if Norisuke didn't pay Joshu, it might start a fight between the two, which might make Josuke want to leave, and Norisuke doesn't want that to happen. Shortly after this, Josuke is asked to look after Daya, the youngest child who is losing her eyesight, which shortly turns into a stand battle between the two. But during this, Norisuke sees Daya seducing Josuke, and they appear to be getting into it, although Norisuke doesn't interrupt them. He bites his tongue and lets them continue as if he was the one who instructed Daya to attack Josuke, and he walks away with a super malicious inner monologue, saying, eventually, I'm going to kill that Josuke, but for now, it'll be fine to make Josuke a slave in both mind and body. I'll capture him. Josuke's memories will never come back anyhow. So very clearly, having some sort of information the readers do not, having contempt for Josuke, and declaring that his memories will never return, which immediately draws a ton of suspicion to Norisuke and his true intentions of bringing Josuke into his home, which lingers in the air as the story continues as we wait to see Norisuke's true nature, which ends up taking a strange turn shortly after this arc, which we'll come back to as the story progresses for a larger discussion about early Norisuke. So back to the events of Josuke vs. Daya, this fight takes place within the Higashikata home and is a fairly innocent stand battle reminiscent of early fights from part 4, where it isn't always a life or death situation and contained within a smaller scale physically and in terms of the stakes, which also, like a lot of the fights in part 4, end with the two becoming friends or at least on neutral terms. This fight revolves around the concept of memories, which is an important sub-theme in Jojolian, so it's good that the importance of memories is established early on, especially for Josuke. Right before the events of this fight, when Josuke is being shown around the home, he sees a familiar marking on the handrail at the top of the stairs, a symbol which he had also also saw on Kiryoshikage's body, so there must be some sort of connection between the two. But as he tries to investigate further, he is attacked by Daya. Daya's stand ability, California Came Bed, attacks by taking memories away from people, which quickly teaches Josuke the importance of them, as Daya describes memories as happiness, saying happiness is to share memories with someone. And when Josuke is threatened with losing the little memories he has, he realizes what makes him happy and creates a focus within his mind, which begins to mold his character's motivation. One being the goal to find his identity no matter what, and two is Yasuo Hirose, as he also wants to see Yasuo again, to help him, but also because she is his happiness, being the only person he shares memories with. So Josuke vs. Daya is a battle of trickery, trying to trick one another into stepping on shadows, being the stand's activation method. And after a few chapters of back and forth, Josuke is of course able to win by making some sounds with soft and wet, as his opponent is nearly blind. Daya's condition is also a bit of foreshadowing thrown in pretty early, as she describes her stand as a gift from God, as when she was around two or three, she fell into the area where the faults are, which caused her to lose her vision over time, but gain a stand in exchange. So although we would soon learn about the Blessed Lands of Morio and the exchange phenomenon, it's nice that this was thrown in beforehand. Although in retrospect, this implies that Daya kinda got screwed over, as she was always going to be a natural born stand user, as it doesn't seem any of the other family members had used the Blessed Lands or performed an exchange specifically for their stands. So Daya falling in as a child and having prolonged exposure to the ground, most most likely accelerated her stand's development in exchange for her eyesight, when she would have developed a stand later in life regardless. As we see later in the story, the eldest son Jobin did have a stand when he was a child, as well as all of the other family members, Norisuke, Kato, Hato, and Joshu all developed their stands without needing to sacrifice anything. Following this fight, Josuke regains his stolen memories from Daya, and the two kind of just forgive and forget, and all is good from here on out. So Josuke proceeds to investigate the marking, which leads him to the Higashikata family tree, which is the first real big dump of information in regards to the plot's mystery, which is a really cathartic experience as it feels like a reward to the stand battle. These moments happen quite often in the first half of Jojolian and are some of the most satisfying moments in the entire series. Within the Steel Ball Run record book, we see how the family tree has grown since part 7, which was over 100 years ago as Jojolian takes place in 2011, marking the largest time skip forward in between parts. We see that Johnny had married the daughter of Norisuke Higashikata, Rina Higashikata, and the bloodline followed nearly the the exact same path as the original universe, with only slight differences, as the characters up until Holly Joestar are the same, showing that alternate versions of characters such as Lisa Lisa, Joseph Joestar, and Suzy Q did exist in this universe. As well as on the Higashikata side of the family, there's a reference to Tomoko, Josuke's mother, from part 4. This reveals the connection between Josuke and Johnny, as Kira is a distant descendant of Johnny Joestar. So at this point in the story, we know that Josuke is Kira Yoshikage, but also somehow not Kira, as earlier during the California Kane bed fight, we had a moment to see what Yasuo was up to, and she had actually done the DNA test with both Josuke's saliva and a piece of hair from Kira's corpse, which came back as a 95.8% accurate match, meaning the DNA must belong to the same person, which gives us an answer to Josuke's identity, but with even more questions. Also during the scene with Yasuo, we see a 
a bit into her personal life, as when she comes home, she sees her mother passed out drunk in the middle of the day with hickeys on her neck. This immediately brings Yasuo to tears, saying this place, this house, even I don't know where I should go. Even I don't know who I am. The state of her mother has clearly caused emotional damage, and Yasuo feels lost in her life and relates to Josuke's lack of identity, bringing them even closer together and giving Yasuo a reason for helping him. As Yasuo thinks that helping Josuke find his identity can also help her find hers in the process and give her some sort of a greater purpose. But back to Josuke, with the knowledge of Kira's past, he declares he will be investigating the family line of the Joestars, which leads him to the only remaining relative from the family tree, Holly Joestar Kira, who leads Josuke to the TG University Hospital. The TG University Hospital itself is a very important location within Jojolian, as it's where Holly resides for the entirety of the part and is returned to quite often, as well as later on will be the secondary setting for the story's climax. On the way to the hospital, Josuke encounters one of the more dangerous stands within the part, Born This Way, with an interesting ability, as it's like Araki had already used the idea of a pursuing vehicle stand as well as a pursuing ice stand, so he just kind of combined the abilities and made something entirely new, similar to Tomb of the Boom from Part 7. Although like many stands in Part 8, it needs a very specific requirement for activation, as the stand can only activate when a specific target opens something, and the definition of open can be pretty liberal, as opening a door can qualify, but also a flip phone or even a pen cap causing the stand to emerge from the objects. As for the stands in this part in general, they are very different from what we had previously in Steel Ball Run, as stands in Jojolian are not very powerful and also not very straightforward, at least most of them, similarly to part 4, and they have by far the most ridiculous activation requirements out of any part before, and I felt like this hindered some fights, as sometimes it would take entire chapters just for a stand to activate and made things feel quite predictable, like the stand fun 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 from earlier, or at least just made for some nonsense moments. Like during the Ozone Baby arc, where the stand's requirement was to bury a model replica of the White House to activate, which wasn't even the stand, as later on, we see the stand has a separate physical form. So what was the point of the toy White House other than just because? Is it a stand? Is it a physical object? Does the user just have to carry this thing around? What happens if it's destroyed? Just what is this thing? What is this? You'll also notice throughout Jojolian that many of the stands have very mechanical and industrial designs, almost like they're robots or made of metal. I think this is to reflect the progression of technology and civilization since Steel Ball Run, as in Part 7, many stands had more organic designs reflecting nature. But coming back to Born This Way, as for the setting of this fight, there is a lot happening here, as Araki is very intentional about the setting during this battle and makes Morio feel like a real place by valuing continuity. Yasuo says to Josuke it'll take about 4-5 to five minutes on foot to reach Mutsukabe shrine, and we follow Josuke's walk pretty much in real time. As he walks, we are reminded of his relative position on the GPS, and the environment reflects that. For example, right before Josuke is about to cross the railroad, we can see the Tori Gate in the background to his northwest, as well as a bit of the TG University Hospital, which is exactly how it's laid out on a top-down map. This is an excellent use of time combining a stand fight with essentially a tour of Morio, especially near the beginning of the story, to get the reader more familiar with the city, as well as be able to throw in easter eggs from part 4, like the Osen shop and the crazy diamond street art. At this point in Jojolian, Araki had provided three maps of the new Morio through extra pages in the volume releases and chapter covers. The layout of Morio is more or less the same as part 4's, although the landmarks are very different and the homes reside in areas we didn't see much of in part 4. It is nice though that through some arcs, Araki gives a realistic depiction of traveling through Morio, which gives an important element of realism to the part, which is something that part 4 was praised for and is replicated perfectly in part 8. We also get an idea of the distance between locations, which is relevant later in the part when characters are traveling between locations. During this arc, Yasuo states it's only a 4-5 to five minute walk from the Higashikata home to the Mutsukabe Shrine, which is right next to the TG University Hospital. So the town of Morio is probably smaller than you think, it's just really dense. So pretty much any location within the city can be reached well within an hour, which kind of makes me feel differently about the final arc, where the characters were separated between the Higashikata home and the TG University Hospital, which seemed like such a large distance. But if this wasn't retcon later in the part, really the whole time they were only like a six minute walk away from each other. But during Born This Way, Yasuo is also subconsciously using her stand Paisley Park to aid Josuke, as her stand is possessing the GPS on his phone and helping direct him out of the way of danger and when he's unable to see. When Yasuo is at the hospital, she also decides to get some medicine for her bite marks, which leads her to an interaction with Holly Joestar. This scene flows from Yasuo to Holly's perspective, and in Holly's first appearance, she is seen measuring the distance between herself and the birds outside. This is a callback to Josuke's behavior 
in the first volume of Obsessively Measuring Things, showing that Holly is in some way related to Josuke and they express similar behaviors. When Yasuo reaches Holly, she is acting very strange and before she can even ask her anything important, Yasuo is escorted out of the room, which at first just seems like a standard protocol as Yasuo wasn't related to her and didn't know anything about Holly's condition. As Yasuo leaves, Holly notices her stand is activated, although Yasuo doesn't even know she is using it yet. This further expresses how much Yasuo cares about Josuke as it's her subconscious spirit that is helping all it can in order to bring Josuke to her safely, because she wants to see him again. As mentioned earlier, a large part of Jojolian, at least in the beginning, is the romance and developing relationship between Josuke and Yasuo, as it's their attraction to one another and inexplicable feelings which keeps bringing them together and pushing forward for each other's sake. But backing up just a little bit, so the fact that Holly can see Yasuo's stand and is aware of what it is, and later on we see she was also aware of her son Kira's stand, she is most likely a stand user, being a descendant of Johnny Joestar, but we just never saw her stand. Or she could possibly have a dormant stand that allowed her to be aware of stands but not actively control her own, similarly to Holly from the original universe, who both play a similar role. As like Holly in part 3, Holly Joestar Kira is also suffering from an unknown disease that incapacitates her for most of the part as her child finds a way to stop her illness. Coming back to Josuke, the battle of Born This Way continues as he follows a path towards the hospital, and when there, he has a showdown with the stand and eventually gets it to retreat. Although before the stand disappeared, Josuke attached a soap bubble to the stand with properties of loud sounds and strong smells. This leads him to the stand user, who is revealed to be Kei Nijimura. Leading up to this moment was a very fast-paced fight which showed a lot of Morio and also had an almost Ferris Bueller vibe to it, with Josuke running through backyards and people's homes. But now that Josuke located the stand user, he confronts the Higashikata family maid, Kei Nijimura, who also has a Joestar birthmark and was attacking Josuke independently to protect her mother, Holly Joestar, as Kei's real name is Kei Kira, little sister to Yoshikage Kira. So before Kira's disappearance, Kei had infiltrated the Higashikata family to investigate their family's mysteries in the hopes to find information that could help cure her mother's illness. Her alias Nijimura is a reference to the Nijimura family from part 4, and her first name Kei keeps the yen theme naming scheme as Kei references the amount of 10 quadrillion. This reveal also ties into the symbol which led Josuke to the family tree and Holly Joestar, as Kira had written the symbol on his body to locate the book in the home, as he then broke into the home and erased Kei's name from the family tree, which allowed her to infiltrate the family. Which clears up the question of why Kira had that marking on his body. So Kei and Kira, being the son and daughter of Holly, shared the same position in the timeline as Jotaro Kujo in the original universe, and both of them, through their design and personality, reflect different aspects of Jotaro. As Kei's design just so happens to reflect an aspect of Jotaro from each part he appeared in, as the two can be considered counterparts. Her headwear is similar to Jotaro's hat from Star Wars Crusaders, the GU pin on her shirt reflects the various pins that Jotaro wears in Diamond is Unbreakable, including his cameos in Golden Wind, where his appearance hadn't changed much, and finally, the stars on her tights parallel the stars on Jotaro's stone ocean design. As for Josuke and Kei's confrontation, surprisingly, while everyone else seemed to mistake Josuke for Kira in the first few volumes, or at least saw some connection, like the store owner, Ojiro, and Arisuke, Kei seemed to not be concerned about his identity at all, or his uncanny likeness to her brother, only focused on protecting her mother, even going as far as trying to kill Josuke before asking any questions, even though she knows Kira was found dead, yet is still uninterested in what Josuke might be. It's only after Josuke chooses to stop pursuing Holly and not fight anymore that she becomes interested in uncovering his mystery. She looks at his eyes and mouth closer to reveal there are connecting seams. Four eyes and two tongues. Furthermore, she brings Josuke to the blessed land southeast of the Higashikata estate, and reveals the secrets of the land's power, equivalent exchange, by exchanging the contents of two fruits. During this demonstration, Josuke visibly becomes more and more upset. He's getting the answers he's been searching for, who am I, but the truth is too much to bear. As he is now faced with the truth of his existence, which makes Josuke doubt his sense of self. His thoughts and feelings are his own, but his physical body and stand belong to people he's never met that existed before his memories. As Kei tells him, he came from two people, and one part of him is Kira Yoshikage. But Josuke claims, there's no way I'm anyone but me. And he is right, he just hasn't accepted himself yet as an individual. Looking back, the Lemon and the Tangerine is one of the most impactful scenes in Jojolian, which happens really early. At just chapter 17, we get this huge moment bringing to light many key factors that will be relevant for the remainder of the story, such as the two people who make up Josuke, as well as the blessed lands of Morio and the power of equivalent exchange. The mystery element in Araki's writing seems to follow this rule of answer one question, but then ask seven more, as although this confirms the nature of how Josuke came into existence, being a fusion of two characters, we 
now have to ask, how did this happen, and who is the other person, and why is the ground here special? Does all of this relate to the walleyes, and many, many more, which will eventually be answered, although some more vaguely addressed than others, which requires some digging. Although I can't ignore that Kay's actions are strange during this arc, as she tries to kill Josuke for two chapters, but then almost immediately comes to the conclusion that he is half Kiryoshikage, as if she already knew this, yet still forbids Josuke to see their mother. I just don't see why she would have a problem with Josuke wanting to see Holly, considering he is the only remaining parts of Kira in this world and would like to know more about his identity. They could even go together, although it's not even proposed. But backing up a little bit, meanwhile, when Josuke arrived at the hospital and was confronting Kei, Yasuo is also trying to get back into the hospital and reach Holly. Yasuo is brought back in on a stretcher because her bite marks are getting worse, and she mentions again that they may have gotten infected near the walleyes. But when she is brought back into the hospital, it feels suspicious and seemingly forced, like the officers were looking for an excuse to bring her in, and they're just keeping a close eye on Yasuo during the whole situation. While she is waiting for treatment, she eavesdrops on Holly as the doctors examine her. The whole point of this scene is clearly to build upon the larger mystery of Holly's illness, as the doctors determined parts all over her body were taken and not naturally, as if they were stolen. And these missing pieces are what's causing her illness, and it's alluded to the fact that someone or something is taking these things from Holly. As Yasuo's inner thoughts read, Holly isn't sick. She had things taken. By whom? As we can see some x-rays of her brain, which show complete chunks missing from her with no wounds or scars, so clearly something supernatural is at play, and at this point of the story, the only thing we've seen similar to this was Kira's autopsy, where his balls were missing with no scars. Foreshadowing that Holly's illness is connected to this equivalent exchange phenomenon we've seen multiple times throughout the part. As mentioned previously, the TG University Hospital is a very important location in Jojolian, as well as the concept of doctors, as later in the part they would become the primary antagonistic group, and we have the foreshadowing of that very early, as the doctors had exhibited strange and hostile behavior towards Yasuo when going near Holly, and she even says just what sort of weirdo hospital did she get checked into, something she doesn't even know the half of with characters like Dr. Wu and Urban Gorilla practicing there. So following the introduction of Holly, her mysterious illness, and the big reveal of Josuke being a fusion of two people, the part slows down a bit with an in-between chapter, settling the dust from Born This Way and leading into Shakedown Road. This occurs at chapter 18, which is titled Trouble with the Curve in reference to the 2012 Clint Eastwood film, and some thoughts are repeated and reinforced, such as Josuke is two people, half Kira, and half someone else. He wonders who is thinking right now, Kira or the other, and doesn't yet understand that he is his own man, but his current target is Norisuke Higashikata, as he's convinced that Norisuke knows the other half of him, so the current motivation driving the plot is still Josuke finding his identity, specifically his place to return to, as he wants to find out who these two people are that make him, as Josuke is still on this journey of accepting that he is his own person, so for now, he's just looking for a place to return home. So at this point in the story, now that we've covered the nature of Josuke's identity being a fusion of two people caused by equivalent exchange and the blessed lands, I think it's a good time to discuss the meaning of the part's name. In the second volume's author comments, Araki would explain what the part's name Jojolian meant, saying the Leon in the title Jojolian means things like blessed thing, evangelist, and commemorative seal. It's a word from ancient Greek or something like that. By combining the word Jojo, I've meant the title to signify the existence of the protagonist Josuke in this world. So Josuke by existence is a miracle, a define of fate, and something that exists outside of heaven and earth. As how he came to be and what he is is something that by all logic should not exist, which in a way positions him above the logic of the world, which will be important nearing the end of the part. So following chapter 18, where Josuke in some ways comes to terms with himself, he decides he wants to go to school to learn more about himself, but not from looking into his past, but rather to the future, to find things he's good at and maybe learn his nature, which is nice to see this steady development of Josuke accepting himself throughout the part. On the way to school, Joshu suggests that they should go down Shakedown Road, with the plan to use Josuke to learn the secrets of the extortion, which is definitely in line with Joshu's character, because if we know anything about him so far, it's that he's greedy, and he's always trying to get money. When on Shakedown Road, things play out in very typical Jojo fashion, with the mystery of a stand's ability affecting Josuke and Joshu, and it takes them a chapter or two to figure out how the stand works and how they can fight back. The stand activates by a person or object being on top of the autumn leaves. It will then slide you somewhere nearby and return you to your original position nearly instantly. To further explain, Josuke had moved about five meters across the street, knocked into a fish tank, and then returned to his original position while being completely unaware that he had even moved. What's most interesting about the stand battle is that there is no stand user. Rather, the stand exists in nature with no intent of its own. It simply does what it does. And the people of Morio have begun to realize how it works over time and have established unspoken rules.
rules for the street. So you have these groups of people targeting Josuke, but they are not stand users. Rather, they are using the stand to their advantage to extort him, which is how the street got its nickname of Shakedown Road. Later on in this arc, this idea is expanded upon as we see more uses people have created for the stand, like using the leaves for inconspicuous drug deals and advanced movement to chase people down. So in order to exploit this ability, you don't need to be a stand user or even need to know what stands are, as it's described by the denizens as a natural phenomenon. This arc brings back multiple ideas from Diamond is Unbreakable. Firstly, is a villain that extorts a character for cash through a premeditated attack and preys on the target's guilt. As in the case of Shakedown Road, the extortionist often presents the target with undeniable evidence of their mistake, such as Josuke knocking into the fish tank even though he was unaware he did it. So the way these extortions play out are nearly the same idea as the lock from part 4. The second borrowed idea is the natural phenomenon that exists within the city. This is similar to the ghost alley from part 4, and the affected areas are also in the same exact part of the city, on the same street as the Osun shop in both part 8 and 4. Furthermore, these phenomena were a result of past events that had taken place in the city. City. Although it's never outright stated or explained, the ghost alley can be interpreted as a manifestation of Kira's victims haunting the city, or the combined grief felt from the city over the years, which eventually enact their revenge. And the autumn leaves are the lingering energy of Johnny's infinite spin, as this also explains their ability, as the spin in part 7 was often shown to move people in strange ways and quickly. This concept of Johnny's spin, creating a stand we encounter nearly a hundred years later, leads us to a very significant moment in Jojolian, which I'll be referring to for answers about many of the mysteries within this part. The flow of the story from a typical stand battle into the legend of Johnny Joestar is also particularly good, as the entire flashback of Johnny is done naturally through an old man telling a story, which also doesn't just come out of nowhere, as Josuke asks if the Joestar Jizo is connected to a one Johnny Joestar, because he recognizes the name from his family tree. So the old man is surprised that Josuke knows Johnny's name, but not the legend, so he enlightens him. In the legend, we see the end of Johnny's life after Steel Ball Run, and the sins committed for the sake of the ones he loved, as his wife Rinna had fell ill to the rock disease around the age of 27 while they were living in America. It's cool to see that Araki had somewhat of a concept for this arc even back in Steel Ball Run, as in the final chapter, when Johnny gets on the boat to return Gyro's corpse to Italy, we also see Norisuke and his daughter, as they were returning to Japan and Johnny gives them a little wave, so Johnny must have met and fallen in love with Rinna during this trip back east. When Rinna falls ill, this is our first introduction to the Higashikata curse, the rock disease which connects this to the first chapter chapter, with the narration that this is a story about breaking a curse. The narration had also described curses as being an impurity handed down because of a sin committed by a distant ancestor you know nothing about. Although Johnny did not cause the rock disease, but for some reason there is an emphasis on Johnny Joestar's sin. The sin would be him stealing the holy corpse from its resting place to use its power to cure Rinna, as the illness was a medical anomaly that no doctors the world over could cure or determine the cause, with symptoms of losing memories and the skin turning to stone. At this point in the story, we have already seen something similar to this with Holly's condition being described a similar way, and we know Holly is a descendant of Johnny and Rinna, so the reader will make that connection and assume the two are related in some way, building upon the mystery of her condition. Although as we find out later, the two are not related, and Araki does this sometimes in Jojolian, where he makes things seem like they're going somewhere or they're connected, but by the end, there's no connection made. So Johnny would bring the Holy Corpse to Japan for two reasons, one to escape the US government's pursuers and to give of the liberty of living out the remainder of her days in her hometown. When in Morio, we see some familiar locations. The twin meditation pine trees on Morio's coast, which is where Josuke was found and where the walleyes protruded. Johnny had used the holy corpse to remove the illness from Rinna at the base of the twin pines. During this, we have a clarification of the holy corpse's power, which is the phenomenon of removal. Reminding the reader of the laws of nature and how there must always be balance, therefore removal carried the risk of exchanging the disease for something of equivalent value, connecting the corpse's power to the concept of equivalent exchange. This is emphasized in Jojolian as the story is fundamentally a representation of the negative side of the corpse's powers, the curses left in the wake of the blessings. Upon using the corpse's power, Rinna's illness is transferred to their son George, the last person in the world that Johnny had expected to exchange the disease with. Johnny vows not to use the power of the holy corpse anymore and instead, using Tusk Act 4, shoots George in the head in some sort of an attempt to transcend the corpse's effects, as he did to Love Train 
strain in part 7. This effort results in the corpse activating and transferring the rock disease to Johnny, as well as the nail bullet. This attack knocks Johnny off his horse and left unresponsive due to the rock disease. And in this moment, he touches the leaves on the ground and they become imbued with the energy of the infinite rotation, resulting in the stand Autumn Leaves. And Johnny is then suddenly killed by a large rock falling on his head. So Rinna and George are saved and the corpse is brought back to America. And this concludes the legend of Johnny Joestar. What's interesting about the way Araki wrote this flashback is that nearly every action taken and negative result of the Holy Corpse is connected to the larger story of Jojolian in current day, but is never explicitly stated or referred to later on. As many longtime questions to the plot can be found within the details of these pages, if returned to with later context and a keen eye. The first of which I'd like to discuss is the Holy Corpse and the true nature of its power, which is explained slightly different in this arc than it was in Steel Ball Run, as Johnny now calls it the phenomenon of removal, which we should be familiar with from the events of Steel Ball Run, as Funny Valentine had described it in a similar way, as he was the only character who truly understood how the corpse worked, saying in the shadow of happiness, there is cruelty. There is always a balance between the positives and negatives. That's what the holy corpse is. And throughout Steel Ball Run, we had seen the holy corpse used extensively and came to understand it as such, which one may interpret as taking something bad and moving it somewhere else, which it does do on a surface level. But after the events of Jojolian, it in a way recontextualized this power, as we learn of the unseen powers at work that ensure this process, the darkness to the light, the negative to the positive, as the Holy Corpse and all of its power still operates within the laws of nature, and the rule of balance is more of a failsafe activated by a universal logic that goes beyond the power of the Holy Corpse. As the Holy Corpse itself does perform miracles, its power is to give blessings of health and prosperity. It's only because of the unseen forces, the integral need for balance that it can also be described as removal, as once a miracle is performed, the act of exchanging the positive with the negative is a power completely separate from the holy corpse, as what takes over from that point is the flow of calamity and the flow of reason, which explains the one in a million chance of Johnny passing the rock disease to his son and the boulder crushing Johnny's head, as these were invisible forces known as calamity that link together in the greater chain of logic, creating the laws of nature being the balance. In the alternate universe, Araki explores the idea of what it means to exist, as everything in this world must exist, and within existence is a balance of positive and negative energy. This concept can also be viewed as the alternate recreation of fate from the original universe. In Golden Wind, why do bad things happen to good people? Because fate exists, a predetermined destiny created by unseen forces. In the alternate universe, why do bad things happen to good people? Because they exist within the flow of calamity, and everything within this flow is at the mercy of the balance of the positive and negative forces. Because because what exists in the world cannot stop existing or leave the flow of calamity, as it would disrupt the balance which is an unbiased force always working to maintain order. That's fundamentally the philosophy of Jojolian's world and how it works, and what results in the corpse's phenomenon of exchange, as the corpse's power is that of removal. But when it takes that negative energy, it cannot erase it from existence, it needs to go somewhere else. And that is where the flow of calamity comes in, which is a completely separate power from the corpse. So as always, there can exist power which manipulate the laws of nature. In the case of Fate, there's King Crimson, Gold Experience Requiem, and Made in Heaven. And in the alternate universe, D4C, Love Train, Act 4, Wonder of You, and Go Beyond. All of these abilities are able to manipulate or disrupt the flow of calamity. This flow has been a constant force in the world since the beginning of Steel Ball Run all the way up until the end of Jojolian, and have been referred to as many names which are pretty much all synonyms to represent the opposing energy. Light and dark, positive and negative, sun and shadow, happiness, and misfortune, blessings, and calamities, miracles, and curses. And it's this theme that connects Steel Ball Run and Jojolian more than any other element, as these two parts are unmistakably representations of the opposing forces, connected by one man's sin over a hundred years ago, and shown through the miracles and curses they've caused. This power of removal by the Holy Corpse should sound similar to the Blessed Lands of Morio, as the two are heavily connected. I mentioned earlier that during this arc, I would continue a larger discussion about the Walleyes and their true nature, as many questions questions about them are alluded to within this flashback, as it seems this arc was Araki's answer to them, as after this point, they are never really addressed or brought into question in a significant way. So I'm just going to list off a few important moments and details within this arc and the walleyes themselves that should tie everything together. So we discussed earlier the similarities of the walleyes and the devil's palm from part 7, in both function and design, and it's mentioned multiple times that the walleyes appear to be protecting something, be it the land itself or to ward off enemies from the ocean. This 
was brought up in the first chapter and again by Damo Tamaki. When Johnny died, we had seen his infinite rotation continued, creating autumn leaves on Shakedown Road that uses spin energy. And when his head was crushed by a nearby boulder, the only logical explanation is that it was the ability of autumn leaves. Or at least this is the conclusion the reader would come to, as just before this flashback, we had seen the stand quickly move things around. When viewing this in retrospect, I still believe that this was the ability of autumn leaves, but infused with the flow of calamity, killing Johnny. Following Johnny's death, we don't know where he was buried, but it's more than likely somewhere in Morio, as we know that his wife and his son lived close to the Twin Pines, as chapter 110 says the Higashikata family had been living there for over 250 years. This explains why the events in the flashback take place around that area. And after Johnny's death, a shrine was created underneath the Twin Pine trees, which is where the Higashikata family performs their exchanges. This was the location of the first ever exchange, when Johnny used the corpse on Rina. So if Johnny's corpse was buried at the shrine, that would mean his body was underground, and it's very likely that Johnny's corpse and its infinite energy is the source of the blessed land, imbuing the ground with an exchanging power. As when Johnny died, he was using Act 4, and as we've seen with Autumn Leaves, it's entirely possible for his energy to live on and manifest in different ways. As the last time he used his infinite rotation was to perform an exchange from one person to another in close proximity, which is a combination of his infinite rotation and the Holy Corpse's power, which is the exact same power of the Blessed Lands in Morio. If this is true, that would also provide an explanation for the Walleyes, which could be seen as a new Devil's Palm formed around Johnny's corpse. And the earthquake of 2011 was nature's attempt to break apart Johnny's corpse, in the same way natural disasters broke apart Jesus's. Adding to this theory, the unnamed shrine located under the twin pine trees from Jobin's flashback was destroyed by the earthquake and is unseen in current day Jojolian, as it was specified that the twin pine trees were separated from one another during the earthquake, which moved them a substantial distance, as they are now called the Lone Pine Trees. Adding to the idea that the earthquake was trying to move the shrine, in Steel Ball Run, the Devil's Palms would appear around the corpse parts as a means of protection. This could also provide an explanation to what the walleyes are protecting, Johnny's corpse, which hasn't moved much, so it would also explain why the walleyes have gotten larger over time and not gone away. The markings on the walleyes also have visual motifs similar to Tusk's powers, specifically Tusk Act 3's ability of moving something somewhere else. This representing equivalent exchange in Johnny's lasting impact on the blessed lands, and a different kind of devil's palm specific to Johnny's corpse, which could be preserved through similar methods to the holy corpse or because of his infinite rotation. This also connects all the way back to the bite marks, as the bite marks look similar to the markings on the walleyes, and we know they are connected in some way. In the same way that the spin and hamon were used as means to achieve the ultimate goal of a stand, it is possible that the reason the bite marks appear is that it's imbuing people with spin energy through Johnny's infinite rotation, which would also explain why it's awakening dormant stand powers. But I'm certainly not claiming that point as fact, just thought I'd mention their connection as the only theory up until this point is that the bite marks were from Kiri Yoshikage, which still doesn't make much sense. And furthermore, although the Jojolian earthquake was based on the real-life Tohoku earthquake that struck Japan on March 11th, 2011, Araki specifies that the legend of Johnny Joestar had taken place on the 11th of August, 1901, 110 years before the earthquake and the walleyes rose from the ground. So just another small connection between the two events. Also tied up in all of this Johnny Joestar walleyes equivalent exchange business is the unnamed shrine which appears throughout many flashbacks in Jojolian. In the time in between the legend of Johnny Joestar and present day, this shrine is seen as the location where the Higashikata family have been performing their equivalent exchanges for generations. So although the shrine is never flat out explained or given any history, through the events surrounding the shrine, we can paint a pretty good idea of its origin. So the shrine was built sometime after Johnny's death in the same location where he cured Rinna of her disease. The shrine is also in some way connected to Johnny Joestar, as when Kato in her flashback looks at the shrine, she is reminded of the legend of Johnny Joestar and the curse on the lands, implying the two are connected. The shrine is bound by Shimanawa, which is a special robe used in the Shinto religion for ritual purifications and bound often to shrines to indicate a sacred or ritually pure space, being the place where the Higashikata family cleanses themselves from the rock disease through the power of the blessed lands. So here's my theory of the shrine. The shrine was most likely created by Rina Higashikata, as when Johnny saved her, she regained her consciousness and memories and was the only person to witness Johnny's miracle. Thus, she created a shrine in memory of him at the place where he saved her, and possibly buried his corpse there as well. Since Rina was aware that Johnny removed her curse, she most likely passed down this tradition to her family, and discovered the blessed lands by trying to perform the same miracle as Johnny, or by coincidence. If, say, once a child turned to stone, they buried them there thinking they were dead, and then discovered they could be exchanged 
once in the ground. This is absolutely the most likely scenario for how the tradition started. As it's literally never explained, and Rinna was the only person to witness Johnny's miracle and the first person of the Higashikata family to be cured of the disease. So she must have started the tradition as well as involved Johnny's corpse in the process through the shrine. So although it is possible that these mysteries will be further addressed in the Jojo lands, I wouldn't hold my breath as the Walleyes, the Blessed Lands, and Johnny Joestar's curse are just so close to being wrapped up within Jojolian. I just don't see why Araki purposely chose to explain these things in such a vague manner, as this is literally the only leads within the part that connect the Blessed Lands and the Walleyes, two of the most important plot points in the entire part. Another strange part within the Sark that never really made sense in retrospect or was addressed is the implication that Johnny caused a curse through his actions. And then even later, Kato associates the legend of Johnny Joestar with a curse. Although despite all of these connections, Johnny did not cause any curse. And I've seen multiple cases of people misinterpreting the writing as Johnny's sin causing the rock disease and Holly's condition. And I honestly can't blame people for remembering it that way because of how they are associated. When really the rock disease and Johnny's actions have no connection whatsoever, as the rock disease existed and affected the Higashikadas before Johnny was even born. The only lasting impact of his actions from 1901 was the Higashikata family's ability to perform equivalent exchanges, and in a way, overcome the rock disease. So it would make more sense to associate Johnny's sin with causing the miracle of the blessed lands, the light to Johnny's shadow balancing his actions. This method of overcoming the rock disease also relates to Johnny's memorial, as he was remembered with a Jizo statue, which serves the purpose of protecting children. Jizo also protect the souls of unborn babies and children who have died before their parents. This relates to Johnny saving his son George and sacrificing himself for the life of his child, as well as protecting the souls of all of the young children of the Higashikata family who passed away before their parents. And in a way, his Jizo statue is making a difference, as his death allowed the children of the Higashikata family to live longer than their parents. But that about wraps up the legend of Johnny Joestar, and most of the conclusions we can make from within this arc that connect it to present-day Jojolian and the overarching mysteries of the part, as well as bridges the gap between part 7 and 8. The following arc shifts focus from Josuke over to Yasuo, and is a proper introduction of Tsurugi's character, the firstborn child of the next Higashikata generation, who is fated with the family's curse. This arc flows well, paced right after the legend of Johnny Joestar, as it explores more into the rock disease and how it works, which also lets the readers piece the puzzle together with the context of Johnny's past. So the rock disease is a curse, which is the impurity within the Higashikata family, and during Tsurugi's introduction, he explains the history of the disease and their family's tradition at length. So although Rina Higashikata was the first victim of the rock disease we saw, this is in fact something that has affected the family for an unknown amount of time, at least 250 years. It's only within the past 100 years the family has developed a method for overcoming the curse through the Blessed Land's equivalent exchange ability. Tsurugi says that before this was discovered, the family didn't always perform exchanges, they just accepted that the firstborn child would die young. So now the family tradition is for an elderly family member, either the mother or the father, to exchange the rock disease with their firstborn child. This disease will begin to affect the eldest son of each generation, beginning around the age of 10 for boys and a little later for women, sometime in their 20s, as seen with Rina. The disease is incurable and does result in death. The effects begin with memory loss and impaired motor functions, and eventually your skin hardens like stone and you die completely. So although it's implied that before Rina, every firstborn child had died, although it is possible that Norisuke the first, as seen in Steel Ball Run, did somehow survive the disease, as his design had patches all over his head like he was covering up scars, and we've seen the disease can leave scars on survivors like Jobin. As well as there was this strange detail revealed within Steel Ball Run that Norisuke had two belly buttons, which was never explained or addressed further, and as we've seen in Jojolian, there are many ways for someone to have physical anomalies through things like the Blessed Lands and the Rokakaka fruit. So possibly the first Norisuke had performed an exchange, somehow, with a Rokakaka fruit, or this was foreshadowing of the strange things within Morio way back in Steel Ball Run, although it's not even confirmed that Norisuke was the first child of his generation, so it's also possible his two belly buttons were just a deformity and he never had the disease at all. But back to present day in Sarugi, I should probably mention the mysterious plot point of the washed up baby, which was mentioned at the beginning of this arc. When Yasuo reads an old newspaper from the Meiji era, which reported about Johnny Joestar's death, there was also the mention of a baby which was washed up on the shore and rescued. The baby had light frostbite and was covered in expensive jewelry. The baby's parents were never found and their identity remains unknown. At the time, this did seem important as there was quite a bit of detail in the story as well as Yasuo pondered about whatever happened to the baby. And like the bite marks and the flashback man, fans held their breath for this one to be answered and never was. Although unlike the flashback man and the bite marks, I don't think this was ever intended to be expanded upon. As 
I think the only reason for this inclusion was to reference Johnny using the power of the Holy Corpse and reinforcing the theme of miracles and calamity, as the calamity was the child being thrown into the ocean, which then balanced out by the boy surviving and returning with expensive jewelry, as it was stated that this all happened on the same day, so it must have had something to do with the corpse being in Japan. But this event occurred over a hundred years ago, so even if this child was important in some way, they would still be dead in present day, and wouldn't show up in the story. So following this baby business, Yasuo encounters Surugi in his little bunker that he lives in, which is separated but still connected through a tunnel to the main Higashikata home. The bunker was designed for the eldest child to live in as they await the rock disease. Also, the family believes that dressing Surugi as a girl will delay the disease by tricking the universe into thinking they're a girl. During this interaction between Yasuo and Surugi in the bunker is where most of the explanation for the rock disease happens, because Surugi likes Yasuo and wants to talk to her. Though shortly after Yasuo leaves, ensues a fairly innocent stand battle after Surugi activates his stand on her. And like most of the fights between the family members, no one is in serious danger during this arc, as Paper Moon King Surugi's stand makes everyone's face look the same, and it interrupts Yasuo's plans to meet up with Josuke for about three chapters. During this time, we get to see a little bit more of Morio, as well as Yasuo's resolve when it comes to being with Josuke and how strongly she feels towards him, which also gives Joshu plenty of time to just still be creepy. So the reason for the stand attack was because Surugi wanted to spend more time with Yasuo, because he likes her and he's immature, and this is his way to bring Yasuo back to him. But throughout the story, they do develop a pretty nice big sister, little bro dynamic. This arc was mostly focused on Yasuo to further develop her stand, as well as reinforce the idea that her and Josuke like each other, as this idea of seeing each other is what was pushing them forward. Also during this arc, there is a strange panel where a character that looks exactly like Josuke is looking at Yasuo from within the mysterious room in Surugi's bunker that also has Josuke's shirt in it. This is never mentioned again, but it was most likely Yotsuyu, as he appears in the bunker in the next chapter, although with a completely different design. Just another really strange moment in retrospect, as I'm sure Araki already had an idea for Yotsuyu's design, yet drew this spooky Josuke anyways. Also, the room I just mentioned was a small cell-like room within Surugi's bunker that suspiciously had a pair of Josuke's clothes and various toys and memorabilia. This could have been tied to what Norisuke said earlier about wanting to trap Josuke, but as the story unfolds, it was most likely designed for Kira Yoshikage, as he may have been living there at some point. So the whole Paper Moon Kane arc resolves with Yasuo returning to Surugi as he planned, and tells her a bit about stand abilities. In this scene, we get some solid foreshadowing where Surugi mentions that all of the family members have a stand, so it gives us something to look forward to, as we have yet to see Norisuke, Hato, and Jobin stands. So while Yasuo sleeps in the bunker, we transition into the introduction of Yotsuyu Yagiyama. Yotsuyu first appears as an enemy of Josuke with no known affiliation, and attacks Yasuo in the bunker. His level of experience is something rarely seen in Jojo, as he forces Yasuo to bring her stand out and examines it closely to determine its ability and power. So I thought that was just really interesting and unlike anything we have seen before from a stand user, and shows he has a lot of experience with stand fights. So just a reminder that this guy is big trouble. Also in this first appearance, Yotsuyu uses an ability that some may consider a retcon, as he produces a thin silicone film from his eyeballs, and later on, we see this is completely unrelated to his stand ability. This is simply one of the many natural abilities of rock humans, like hardening their skin and blending in with the environment, foreshadowing the anatomy of rock humans being silicone-based creatures, the backup or failsafe to the carbon-based humans. Upon Yotsuyu's introduction, he spills a lot of juicy details that implies he's from Josuke's past, saying, we've been watching you this whole time, also implying he's part of a larger group, as well as that he needs to ensure Josuke doesn't get his memories back and he must die one more time. So clearly this man knows something about Kira's death and why Josuke was buried underground. Meanwhile, leading up to the I Am A Rock fight, Josuke has a confrontation with Norisuke in the orchard. He comes out and says he's suspicious of Norisuke and wants to question him, asking him flat out if he killed Kira Yoshikage. This leads into quite a bit of exposition from Norisuke, which not only proves his innocence, but also establishes character from this point on as a good guy, and clears his previous suspicion. So it seems Norisuke's character in the beginning of Jojolian was a red herring, or just completely changes. As for most of the story so far, there has been a sinister and mysterious undertone to the Higashikata family. Norisuke takes a stranger into his home, no questions asked, rolls out the red carpet, then proceeds to allow his daughter to attack him and steal his memories, but then claims, I will kill that Josuke, trap him, make him a slave, etc., also claiming his memories will never come back, having a confidence that alludes to Norisuke having some understanding of Josuke's identity. But in chapter 27, without any significant development to their relationship, Norisuke tells Josuke, I think of you as my own son, that's why I took you into this household, as Norisuke had taken in Josuke with the assumption that half of him was Kira, in the hopes that Kira's memories will return and help him cure the Higashi 
Ashikaga disease with his lost memories. As before Kira died, he seemed to have found a cure which was lost. So if that was the only thing Norisuke assumed about Josuke, there is no way he could know for sure his memories wouldn't return. And if Norisuke did know his memories would never return, it would be pointless for him to bring him into his home, let alone trap him in mind and body as he said earlier. So the whole shift in Norisuke's character is undeniable in retrospect and something that certainly wasn't done perfectly and reads a bit strange when returning to the story. But from here on out, Norisuke is a much more consistent character, as following this interrogation, Josuke and Norisuke build their trust, and Norisuke offers to help Josuke in his pursuit to uncover the truth of his identity, and shows Josuke his stand, which is something very personal, like showing someone your porno stash or asshole, according to Norisuke. So as these two decide to work together, we shortly encounter another stand, I Am A Rock. I Am A Rock is among the most important arcs in Jojolian, as this fight introduces us to the true antagonists of the part, the Rock Humans, who fulfill a few different roles thematically. The first of which is the idea of an evil lurking within Morio and assimilating with society unnoticed, being the alternate version of the threat posed by Kira Yoshikage and Kosaku Kawajiri in part 4, but now on a much larger scale, being this evil which sleeps within the once quiet town, and a danger lurking behind every street corner, as even your neighbor could be a serial killer or a rock human. But more importantly, in the world of Jojolian, the rock humans are the shadow casted by the light of humans, being the result of the universe's need for balance, and forcing the part's constant theme of duality. The rock humans are a species that have existed within the alternate universe for as long as humans, so it is possible we may have encountered a rock human in Steel Ball Run. Throughout Jojolian, tons of specific information about rock humans was revealed, such as their anatomy, life cycle, likes, dislikes, mating habits, evolution, social behavior, and more. One difference between species lies in their anatomy, being a silicone-based life form which can harden its body like stone and be able to sustain themselves under long periods of hibernation and sleep for months at a time. The rock humans otherwise appear indistinguishable from humans. The other difference lies within their psychological behavior, as nearly all rock humans lack empathy and have extreme sociopathic tendencies, as it's stated that rock humans on rare occasions will fall in love with humans of the opposite sex, but 97.5% of the relationships will end with the rock human murdering their partner. It's also said that 95% of rock humans are stan users, which is interesting as stans are something awoken by the spiritual part of a person, so the difference in anatomy shouldn't influence the rate of stan users. This may be a result of the rock human's proclivity to nature and the blessings of the earth, having a great respect for nature and the supernatural found within it, leading to their obsession with the blessed lands of Morio as well as the Rokakaka fruit throughout the part. So possibly, because they spend more time in nature and in contact with the earth, they are more likely to develop a stand. The rock humans are fundamentally parasitic creatures, as over the course of thousands of years, humans had outpopulated and overtook the rock humans due to their ability to cooperate with one another, rapidly advancing their society, as well as through their rise in population and deforestation, they have taken away many of the rock humans' natural habitats. For this reason, rock humans have been forced to assimilate with human society, gain their knowledge, speak their language, steal their family registries, their identities, gain property, have jobs, and more. Although it's important to distinguish that the only reason rock humans go through the trouble of all of this is because of their parasitic nature, as they don't have a natural desire to earn money or be successful from a societal standpoint. They are simply using the humans for their own survival, leeching off of them like parasites. Although much later in the part, we learn of the rock humans' ultimate goal to overtake humans and once again become the dominant species. While this plan does involve culminating massive amounts of wealth, it's done for the reason of survival and to have the resources to place humans underneath them. Because of this goal, we see rock humans exhibit unnatural behaviors, such as working together in larger groups. Although Araki does state that the relationship between the rock humans is nothing beyond give and take, and that there is no love or friendship between them. So with an introduction of rock humans, we can return to I am a rock. During this fight, we see Norisuke stand King Nothing, which is activated to help Josuke locate Yasuo, who had been taken by Yotsuyu, being able to track down the scent of people and objects. Also, when Josuke notices that Yasuo is missing, we see the return of Dark Determination, a visual motif from Steel Ball Run and Stone Ocean to signify an immense emotional rage within someone who's willing to kill. But upon King Nothing's reveal, I'd like to point something out in relation to the Higashikata family stands. While the naming scheme is obvious as they all contain the word King in the names as their family is in a great position in Morio, they all also relate to the overall theme of Jojolian and how the story has been unfolding so far, which enriches the story and creates a way more compelling tone. As California King Bed could steal memories, relating to the rock disease and Josuke's loss of memories, while Joshu's Nut King Call, as we saw awoken during the Shakedown Road arc, is based on the idea of fusing, putting things together and taking them apart, connecting pieces with nuts 
nuts and bolts. Paper Moon K now appears as origami, which has been used to describe the effects of the rock disease, as well as its ability symbolizes loss of identity. And K nothing is probably the most glaring symbolism of how it's made of puzzle pieces and is able to uncover mysteries. And these connections may not even be something you recognize when reading, and you don't have to, as it almost creates a subconsciously consistent tone to the story. So as the I Am A Rock fight continues, Norisuke shares some of his past and how he was cured from the rock disease. This reinforces the concept of equivalent exchange, leading up to the reveal of the Rokakaka, as well as calls back to the legend of Johnny Joestar. So the stand I Am A Rock has the ability to make its target the center of a gravitational force, resulting in the target being crushed by objects being pulled towards the center of gravity. Yotsuyu is able to activate this ability unnoticed by disguising himself as a rock, as well as was able to get close to the family by manipulating Tsurugi through the promise of being able to cure his rock disease with the power of a mysterious fruit, which he demonstrated by feeding a piece of the fruit to the family dog, Awaske, which was healed. And Awaske himself is a curious case in Jojo Land as he's sort of this stray rock dog that hangs out around the Higashikata family's house and the walleyes and becomes attached to Tsurugi. It's never really explained if Awaske was always a rock animal or just a regular dog, which underwent some evolution by always hanging out around the blessed lands. As well as throughout the part, we had seen that Awaske had eaten multiple Rokakaka fruit, which may have contributed to a sort of evolution, as he's able to turn his skin to stone like rock humans, as well as has a stand-like ability of being able to phase through walls. But whatever Awaske is, we love him. He's adorable, he's the family dog, and he's even with the family in the final chapter. And when Yotsuyu feeds Awaske the fruit, this would be the first time we see the Rokakaka used, which will become a central focus of the plot moving forward. And before we get too deep into this arc, I'd first like to discuss the stand's musical reference. Musical references and their lyrics often carry a varying amount of weight in the stands and characters they're named after. I won't be delving into every musical reference in the part, but this musical reference for I Am A Rock is particularly important, as it's an allegory for the lifestyle of rock humans. It's also likely that the song itself was a catalyst for the concept of rock humans, a foundation for the idea, considering it's used to introduce them to the story. The song by Simon and Garfunkel is sung through the perspective of a misanthropic recluse detailing their way of life, and how they've chosen to leave love behind and embrace being alone. Nearly every lyric of the song can be applied to the rock humans, so I will let you listen to the lyrics with some notes added onto each line. The audio will be edited for copyright reasons, and if in the future this section is muted, I apologize. And you can always pull the song up in a different tab and listen while watching. A winter's day In a deep and dark December I am alone Gazing from my window to the streets below On a freshly fallen silent shroud of snow I am a rock, I am an island I built walls, a fortress deep and mighty That none may penetrate I have no need of friendship Friendship causes pain It's laughter and it's loving I disdain I am a rock I am an island Don't talk of love Well, I've heard the word before It's sleeping in my memory I won't disturb the slumber of feelings that have died If I never loved, I never would have cried I am a rock, I am an island I am shielded in my armor Hiding in my room, safe within my womb I touch no one and no one touches me I am a rock I am an island And a rock feels no pain And an island never cries 
So while a lot of the time in JoJo, we can only assume Araki takes influence from lyrics, although sometimes it's quite obvious. And in the case of I Am A Rock, the stand user Yotsuyu literally sings the lyrics of the song during his arc, making its influence pretty undeniable. So I'd like to think that the song itself inspired the idea behind the whole concept of rock humans and their behaviors. And I just like that idea of Araki listening to music and being so inspired by lyrics that influences his manga. Just a really cool creative process that combines his love for music and art, which is pretty much what Jojo is. So as for the actual fight during this arc, it's just all right. The battle is very dialogue heavy as nearly every action taken is explained in great detail, as well as the characters are describing their observations about Yotsuyu. Although most of the dialogue is important and is what readers want to hear, such as the anatomy of rock humans and how Yotsuyu will occasionally allude to Josuke's identity and their history together. The fight ends with Josuke tackling Yotsuyu into the water and even at this climax, the characters continue to talk in great detail, as well as Josuke is also talking to Norisuke on the surface through his soap bubbles, asking him to find nets and toss them into the water and such. So there is a lot to be said between these two characters, but it does impede on the pacing of the action quite a bit, as I feel like if this fight was ever animated, it would feel like it's moving in slow motion. After this arc, the story takes a moment to reflect on itself and what Josuke is thinking about his situation, which is appreciated considering many mysteries have been introduced up until this point, and they all seem to be connected in some way. The Higashikata curse, Holly's disease, rock humans now, the walleyes, mysterious fruits, and more. These revelations have given Josuke a further purpose in life as he is connected to these mysteries through Kira Yoshikage, someone who he thinks found a way to cure the disease. For this reason, Josuke declares he will find the cure for the sake of finding out who he is, further defining his motivation, which is great for your main character that's been consistently happening after nearly every arc. So for the characters, the most accessible next step is to learn more about the fruit Yotsuyu had carried. This fruit was what allowed Yotsuyu to manipulate Tsurugi and seems to be able to cure the rock disease or at least revert the effects. Josuke had seen a fruit fall into the ocean after killing Yotsuyu, which was swept away by the current, but there was another piece of the fruit taken by Yasuo, who was rescued during this arc. Norisuke investigates the fruit and claims they need to find the source, the tree in which it was harvested. Using King Nothing, he's able to recreate the branches of the tree and invites Josuke to their fruit parlor to search their database for a match. When they arrive, Norisuke gives a detailed tour of the parlor and explains how he operates his business through the idea of flow, how the parlor's location is perfect for the flow of customers, how he prepares the food creates a flow when eating and offers an optimal experience to enjoy all of the flavors. Norisuke elaborates on flow, saying everything here has a natural flow. Now flow is a metaphor, but if you don't fight it, you'll definitely reach your goal. Flow being a metaphor for fate in the alternate universe and a term that is used a lot in Jojolian, as we come to learn the balance of good and bad luck traps all who exist within the universe within this flow. Also during this scene, we see the symbolic importance of fruit within the part and how fruit is special and something you should give to someone when they're going through a hard time or they lose a loved one, just being that fruit symbolizes hope, which is the overall message of Jojolian, also being a reasonable vessel for the powers of the Rokakaka throughout the story, a supernatural phenomenon with healing powers, akin to the holy corpse from Steel Ball Run. But moving into the next arc, as around this time and at the fruit parlor, we are introduced to the eldest son, Jobin, who has had quite a bit of build up to his reveal, as he was mentioned often but absent from the story as he was away on business. Shortly into Jobin's introduction, he is immediately the target of suspicion. His design is more antagonistic and detailed than the other family members, and there seems to be a conscious effort to associate Jobin with the rock humans, foreshadowing his secret activities. As when we first see him, he is in a crouched position, reminding us of Yotsuyu from earlier, as well as his spiky design further associates him with the motif of rocks. And the first words we hear Jobin speak are, it's okay to make mistakes, right? You're only human after all. Although this menacing tension is briefly shattered as Norisuke and Jobin share a laugh after Norisuke recognizes he's referencing the Japanese poet Ida Mitsuo. They catch up for a bit, which highlights Jobin's expressive and childish personality, as well as the quote leads into his immaturity, as when you think Jobin's saying something profound, he's actually just mimicking the words of someone else. Before they leave the fruit parlor, Josuke recognizes that Kane Nothing activated subconsciously as it found traces of Yotsuyu's fruit on Jobin, bringing him back into the crosshairs of suspicion, as he has undeniably been in contact with the tree which the fruit came from. Although the story now needs to jump through some hoops to explore this mystery further, as Norisuke had told Josuke and Surugi earlier not to tell anyone about the fruit or Yotsuyu. Although this is something I find strange about Jojolian and it's how reserved many of the characters are and how they just don't talk to each other. For instance, Jobin had just returned from researching fruit in Vietnam and the Philippines for the Higashikata family business. And Josuke and Norisuke had just found a foreign fruit that they wanted to research, a fruit that is rumored to cure the rock disease. Norisuke easily could have brought up the subject to Jobin or asked him if he had seen any fruit like this in his research in complete innocence, or at the bare minimum, share 
the information that they found this fruit, considering it pertains to the rock disease, something that plagues the family and is particularly relevant to Jobin, as his son will soon experience the symptoms of the disease any day now, and it's undecided who will perform the exchange. The argument for this lack of communication could be that Norisuke is just trying to protect his family and doesn't want to involve his son in any dangerous affairs or have Jobin worry that his son was in danger. Although later on, it's clear that this lack of confrontation is for the sake of convenience, as the friction between Jobin and his family will be addressed later in the part after it has more time to grow. As for now, the story makes a conscious effort to give reasons why no one would inform Jobin about what's been happening, as well as pit Jobin against the other characters, with Josuke, Tsurugi, and Yasuro orchestrating a plan to investigate Jobin right under his nose, further separating these characters. So with all things considered, this is a pretty clever way for Araki to snowball a few ideas and plot points into one continuous flow, that progress the story naturally and give a clear objective for Josuke, which includes Jobin's introduction and a connection between himself, the fruit, and Yotsuyu, as well as a point of tension. Because if Jobin wasn't introduced at this exact moment, the characters wouldn't really know where to go next. Their first idea was to research the fruit at the fruit parlor, but of course they wouldn't find anything about this fruit in books or online, so it would be back to square one, just waiting around for the next stand user or rock human to attack. It's not really something you notice when reading, which is kind of the point of a flow, but when you really look at the writing of early Jojolian, it highlights how far the series has come in terms of its integration of stand fights into the story. A good analogy for this improvement is the difference between obstacles and stepping stones. As in earlier parts, a lot of the stand battles would feel like roadblocks getting in the way of the character's objective, or just some action thrown in between traveling. Of course, not all of them, but certain parts definitely took a different approach to the definition of progress, but I'm sure you guys know what I'm talking about when I say some characters were just there for the fight. But in parts 7 and 8, stand battles are re-evaluated and act more like stepping stones which move the story forward. In Steel Ball Run, this was achieved through Johnny's progression, the race itself, and that many stand battles were fought for possession of the corpse, so each win and failure moved the plot in a different direction while no matter what, the race continued. In Jojolian, the same concept applies, but the stepping stones could better be described as puzzle pieces, as each encounter brings us closer to the bigger picture and connects to the other pieces, or introduces completely new ideas that we know are part of the puzzle. For example, up until this point we have been introduced to the rock disease, rock humans, the fruit, and Josuke's mysterious identity. Think of these like corner pieces that need more in between before they connect, which is the purpose most of the minor villain fights serve. You could pick out a few outliers to this idea, such as California Came Bed and Paper Moon Cane, but I'm more willing to give these less important encounters a pass as they still serve some purpose, like introducing characters or themes that will come back later in the story. While other arcs including Ojiro, Kei, and Yotsuyu did provide stand battles, but were also extremely relevant to the overarching story, connecting to earlier plot points. Back at the Higashikata estate begins the next arc, Every Day is a Summer Vacation. While the family socializes and shows each other their nonsense gifts from Jobin, we cut back and forth between present time and a conversation between Josuke and Tsurugi earlier that day. Josuke spares no time telling Tsurugi the truth about his father, how he knows where the fruit came from and is keeping it a secret. For this reason, Josuke wants Tsurugi to tell him what Jobin's stand ability is before he confronts him. Josuke explains his thought process further and why he came to Tsurugi. He thinks that Norisuke will not consider Josuke's accusations and instead side with the eldest son. This confrontation is very aggressive on Josuke's part as he is clearly making Tsurugi upset but keeps on the pressure, telling Tsurugi his father is a questionable person who is keeping secrets, and he plans to corner Jobin and show him no mercy. Eventually Josuke does convince Tsurugi to help and he says that Jobin is more of a child than himself and that his weakness is his pride, so Josuke just needs to find a way to compromise that pride. This arc is a great introduction to Jobin's character through visual storytelling, how he gets a gift for every family member with no consideration of their interests or personality, just showing that he has money to splurge. Also, the entire backdrop for the arc is a beetle fight in Jobin's dedicated collection room, as beetle collecting and fighting is a common hobby among children in Japan, so much so that it was this hobby that spawned the creation of Pokemon, as the initial concept for the game was that it would recreate this feeling of collecting bugs when you were a kid. This fundamental immaturity is the biggest part of what makes Jobin Jobin and will be important to understanding his character and his motives throughout the part. This sparks the idea for Josuke to challenge Jobin to a beetle fight with his prized Palawanicus and win overwhelmingly to accomplish two things. One, discover Jobin's power, and two, take his Lamborghini. Thus begins the fan-named fight, Beetle Tendency. I'll spare the details of the fight itself as it's quite extensive, spanning well over 100 pages, but what's exceptional about this arc is its approach to a stand battle, pitting two characters in a one-on-one -on -one game of wits and trickery, while severely limiting the use of their stands, needing to use them secretly, and needing to devise a strategy within the confides of the game's rules, reminiscent of the Darby Brothers 
brothers from Stardust Crusaders, which were some of the best fights in the part. So while this battle is simply a game, it's almost a perfect template for what makes a fun and exciting stand fight, focusing on the mind games between two opponents, like a game of tug of war, as the Beatles grapple while the two secretly use their stands trying to get the upper hand. This struggle eventually causes Jobin to resort to using his stand, just as Surugi predicted, but the match is ultimately handed to Josuke for being two steps ahead and the more perceptive opponent, which leaves Jobin utterly defeated, losing an eyebrow and his golden Lamborghini, which is what he put on the line at the beginning of the fight, speaking more to his immaturity, as Josuke knew that Jobin wouldn't be able to deny a fight that had to do with his precious beetles, and in his overconfidence bet his own car and eyebrow. And in the process also revealed his stand, just as Josuke planned by compromising his pride. Jobin in his embarrassment corners Josuke cutting through the facades of playful games and straight up tries to attack him with the stand, realizing he most likely has ulterior motives, considering his determination and intent on winning. Jobin is suspicious of Josuke, but also kind of being a sore loser, resorting to violence after winning at his own game. In this confrontation, Josuke uses soft and wet to trigger the fire alarm sprinklers and escapes out of the house, now understanding Jobin's ability to some extent, being able to control temperature, heating up a small area. But the other big reason for this fight was for Josuke to get Jobin's Lamborghini, as after he wins the second match, he gets the keys and uses a soap bubble to send them to Surugi and Yasuo. This is mostly fine and a typical Jojo over the top way of doing things, but at some point, I thought they probably could have just stolen the keys during the beetle fight, as the only reason they needed the Lamborghini was to temporarily access its event data recorder to see where Jobin went the day before to locate the fruit tree. But either way, we get the keys and Yasuo begins to fully awaken her Paisley Park, as she understands a little bit of how her stand works from the Paper Moon Cane fight and thinks she would be able to access the data. But when she actually uses her stand consciously, it turns into one of those abilities that is so powerful but also so vague, it becomes kind of problematic to the continuity of the story. So let me elaborate. At first, Paisley Park, while activated, subconsciously operated as a GPS of good fortune, guiding Josuke through the streets of Morio and giving him an advantage over Born This Way. Later on, Yasuo is able to use the stand physically, moving it through electronics and interact with the physical world, using anything with electronic components as a gateway. But now, as of recently, the stand will occasionally offer Yasuo two choices. Whichever she chooses, Paisley Park will give her that object and will almost always benefit her in some way. For example, when she selected Flashlight, Paisley Park gave her the flashlight, and it came in handy later to find the keys to Norisuke's van, which her and Tsurugi hid inside of. Almost like the stand can predict the future or place Yasuo within a positive flow, like the case with its GPS. On top of this, the stand also seemed to have unlocked the Lamborghini when given Yasuo the flashlight, as the door lifted open while Tsurugi was only holding the key by the keychain, so they probably didn't even need the keys in the first place. The stand immediately shows Yasuo the event record data projected through the stand's face before Yasuo even begins to fiddle with the car, while also providing a first-person view of the car's driving path through some sort of camera that's not the backup camera as it's showing the road from the front. But furthermore, through this footage, Yasuo sees a streetlight camera and just by seeing it within the data is able to access the full recordings of street cameras without having to physically interact with them at all. So by this logic, she didn't even need to go inside the Lamborghini. She could have just looked at it and Paisley Park would magically transmit all of this data directly onto her phone or something. Or she probably could have just touched the Lamborghini without even needing to unlock it. So I am more than willing to exercise my suspension of disbelief when it comes to Jojo, to really immerse myself in its world and its bizarre way of doing things. But during Jojolian, after seeing what Paisley Park is capable of from time to time, it creates so many situations where you can't help but think, if only Yasuo did this, or why didn't Yasuo do this instead? Because she essentially has a do-anything ability under the umbrella of technology. Being able to physically interact and change electronics, also accessing restricted data, cameras, password bypassing, text messages, unlimited instant internet search results on any topic or any person of interest. And in some cases, she doesn't even need to be physically near the thing she's controlling or can just access data just based on a picture. So I don't want to come off as a sort of cinema sins guy here, but Paisley Park is just a really insane ability that is never really given to find limitations. So throughout the story, it's unclear when Yasuo should or shouldn't use her stand to solve problems, as it seems to depend on what's most convenient for the plot. But now with Jobin's driving data, this leads into the next arc, Dubiwa, which is the first fight in the part that doesn't involve Josuke, as we are nearing the halfway point of the story and the cast has grown quite a bit, which gives the freedom to explore the actions of other characters and dynamics. This arc follows Yasuo and Tsurugi as they use their stands together to investigate the man seen in Jobin's driving data who had the mysterious fruit tree. This arc does a few interesting things, the first of which is that it shows more into the group associated with Yotsuyu, who are a group of rock humans that smuggle the fruit into Japan and sell it to high-paying customers that Jobin also seems to be associated with in some way. 
As in this arc while telling Aisho the newest rock human, we see him sell a fruit to an old man, who eats the fruit and quickly regrows his leg but loses his eyesight, highlighting its power of equivalent exchange, which also seems to have a connection to the rock humans, or at least their DNA, being silicone-based creatures, as whatever is lost in an equivalent exchange will turn to stone and crumble away. The other big revelation is Jobin's involvement with these rock humans, as nearing the end of the arc, Sarugi uses his stand to make Aisho think a boss is Jobin, and he talks to him about a sort of contract or agreement they have, bringing Jobin further into the spotlight of Suspicion, who already had an antagonistic vibe in the last arc, and now seems to be involved in the criminal underworld, unaware of the consequences his actions may bring due to his childish nature, as during this arc, his own son is threatened with death twice due to his actions. The actual fight occurring during this arc is just alright in my opinion. The stand du Biwa is an automatic tracking stand, which forms a tornado-like vortex in response to the target's breath, and attacks from the physical stand located within the tornado. So really, the ability is just fine, I more so have a problem with its attack method being a long-range automatic type stand, which there seems to be a lot of in Jojolian, which don't necessarily make for the most interesting of fights, as it's less and less of a stand battle, and more so the main character is just taking damage and running away trying to overcome an automatic ability, which usually involves area of effect abilities or being attacked by an auto-pursuing stand that can't be fought directly until you find the stand user. These include I Am A Rock, Doobie Wa, Blue Hawaii, Ozone Baby, Brainstorm to some extent, and The Wonder of You. So quite a lot in the second half of Jojolian, and they also play out quite predictably, as the main characters are surprised in the first chapter, and they don't know where this attack is coming from, and they're just tanking damage, and then in the next two or three chapters, they need to find out where the stand user is, and it goes from there. But coming back to Doobie Wa, while the user I show is short-lived, he does have a backstory which reinforces the theme of calamity or bad luck, specifically in Jojolian, as he is an overwhelmingly unlucky man, stuck in a negative flow, sort of the opposite to Poco Loco from Steel Ball Run, who is riding the flow of good luck. So if within this universe there's an equal amount of positive and negative energy, one might ask why is Poco Loco able to live this overwhelmingly positive life? And it's because we have characters like Aisho that exist that have an overwhelmingly negative life, which balances out everything in terms of all of the shared energy within the universe. This is also symbolic of the positive and negative energy representing light and dark, as Poco Loco, being the human, was stuck in the positive flow, while the rock humans, who can be seen as the shadow casted by human life, was stuck in the negative flow. But following Aisho, the pacing really picks up, as in just a few volumes we encounter the entire Damakon group, being the first batch of villains within the part who are all rock humans involved in the trade of the Rokagaka, which is also heavily connected to Josuke in the past. And another really solid aspect of this arc is that both of the side characters involved also have clear defined motivations. Sometimes in Jojo, side characters' motivations can come into question if you really think why do they care so much about helping the protagonist? Although through Sarugi, he needs to find the cure to the rock disease as he's going to experience it any day now, as well as his father is involved in this drug trade and he wants to learn the mystery behind him. And Yasuo is romantically interested in Josuke and wants to help him find his identity, as well as lacks purpose in her life so she thinks that through this mission, it will help her find herself as well. So although this arc lacks the protagonist, you still feel invested in Sarugi and Yasuo's mission because of everything that was set up beforehand. As the plot begins to weave together further Josuke's connection to the Rokakaka, we are introduced to more characters that have ties to the events before the 311 earthquake who help fill in the gaps. So following Dubiwa, Josuke and Yasuo are reunited with each other, bringing them both to tears, further developing their bond and romantic feelings for one another, as shortly after this, we see the two on a date essentially, where they are just spending time together without any pressing matters, just holding hands, singing songs about fried chicken, and enjoying a view. Which is one of the rare moments we get to see these two just enjoying each other's company, without the threat of death right around the corner, where they can just talk to each other and learn about each other and learn why they love each other. And I just wish there was more moments like this throughout Jojolian that further developed their relationship and made the stakes of losing each other even higher. As Araki himself said he would like to explore new genres within the story through their relationship. And while I understand the romance might not be everyone's cup of tea, I just wish we had one dedicated chapter, maybe an interlude or something, that was specifically focused on a date between Josuke and Yasuo and them telling each other how they feel. And I think moving forward and when they see each other in danger in future arcs, that would make such a big difference for the readers and for the characters. But because this is still Jojo, which is a very action-oriented series, I guess this is the best we're gonna get, and it's just implied that the two spend time with each other off screen. As this cute moment is quickly interrupted by a woman who recognizes Josuke being the first lead on his second identity as she refers to him as a name we haven't heard before. This woman's name is Carrera and possesses the stand Love Love Deluxe, being the alternate version of Yukako in Love Deluxe from part four, having a stand that can manipulate hair. This arc is interesting because we spend a few chapters following Carrera around Morio and there's not a fight or anything, 
Rather, we just see her interactions with various characters and how she uses her stand on a daily basis to get by. Which we don't see often in JoJo, but it is often discussed by fans on how these characters would use their stands in everyday life and what stand would be the best for just an ordinary person. So it's always really cool to see Araki using the concept of stands, but not in a combat environment. While following Carrera, Josuke is kind of pretending to be who she thinks he is, as he doesn't want to scare her or blow his cover and wants to learn more about who she thinks he is. And we eventually get a name, Josefume Kujo, and a photograph of Kira, Josefume, and Carrera all together. So immediately, we can see that this new character is the other half of Josuke, looking very similar as well as Josefume's design as that of an alternate Josuke from part 4 having a pompadour, as well as he has a Joestar birthmark. Although Josefume's birthmark is a pretty big discrepancy as the story continues, and it's often debated if this was a mistake on Araki's part or not, so it's not impossible that Josefume is somehow related to Johnny, being that within the family tree, there are multiple unnamed daughters being descendants of Johnny and George. Although in this photo, an equal amount of skin is visible on both Kira and Josefume's shoulders, and Kira's birthmark is missing when Josefume's is visible, but we know for a fact that Kira has the birthmark, so possibly he drew it on the wrong character. Because as the story continues, we never see Josefume drawn with a birthmark again, even when his entire shoulder is visible and when he was a child. Although within subsequent volume releases of Jojolian that contain slight corrections, and later in the story, this photograph appears again and Josefume still has the birthmark, so it seems to be intentional by Araki, although the connection between Josefume and Johnny is not made clear. So we'll just add this to the pile of lingering mysteries in Jojolian and hope for some resolution in the Jojo lands. So while Josuke and Carrera are catching up, or rather Josuke is pretending to know what's going on while Carrera talks to him, the two have been being tailed by a duo of rock humans, the Aphex Twins, which when they finally confront Josuke, ensues one of the coolest fights in the entire part. I mentioned earlier how many stand battles in Jojolian involve long range or area of effect type stands, so the twins make for a great change of pace and action as the two possess close range stands, shot key number one being able to transfer anything the user touches from their left hand to their right, and shot key number two being a soccer ball which contains a deadly virus inside. And seeing Josuke literally fist fight these two while using soft and wet to redirect attacks and trick the twins in split second decisions is some of the best choreographing and stand fighting in the series, as it's not often in Jojo that stand battles come down to a fist fight, but when it does, it always makes for a great scene. And this is no exception, as it shows us how capable Josuke really is in a fight and some cool ways he can use soft and wet. As well as nearing the end, Carrera jumps back in to deal the finishing blow, giving them a tag team moment using their stance together, so just A plus for the actual fight in this arc. But before the fight and a little bit during, we learn some interesting things alluding to Josuke's past as well as Kira Yoshikage, as Carrera tells us that Kira was in possession of a fruit which he planned to use on his mother, as well as one of the twins remarks that Josuke's ability is similar to Kira Yoshikage's, saying taking and making things explode, it's like Kira's, as we had seen earlier that Kira in the alternate universe also had the stand killer queen. This arc ends with Carrera quickly exiting after telling Josuke who she thinks he is, saying you look the way you do because you did an equivalent exchange with Kira, having some understanding of how the fruit works and its value, claiming she would also like one for herself to make money. When Carrera says goodbye, she tells Josuke they'll meet again someday, and for the remainder of the part, people awaited Carrera's return, although she never came back. People sometimes write this off as an Iraqi forgot, when that's really not the case at all. She was simply saying goodbye to Josuke. She even says, but when that'll be is a secret, implying it could be a long time from now or never. And in the page just before this, Carrera was inspired by Josuke moving on from his past, telling herself that if he can do it, she can also break away from this piece of shit world too, implying that she's moving on and possibly leaving Morio because of her past here and that more rock humans may be looking for her. As well as later in the story, during the final arcs, there is really no reason for Carrera to come back, as she isn't much of an ally and probably wouldn't be too inclined to help the Higashikata family. If anything, she may have wanted to take the fruit for herself. So as it stands, I really don't have a problem with this being Carrera's last appearance besides the flashback. She showed up when the time was right, fulfilled a specific purpose for the plot, and exits smoothly, not really having a connection to any of the current cast members, as well as with a motive to move on with her life. So now with four rock humans down, we enter the climax of the first half of the part, and one of the most highly regarded arcs in all of Jojo, Vitamin C. In my opinion, this is the best arc in Jojolian, and potentially the best arc in all of Jojo, as throughout these nine monthly chapters, we learn the truth of Josuke's identity through a flashback which is spliced in between the present day fight against Damo Tamaki, the leader of the fruit smuggling group, and the Higashikata family, which is done in a way that offers an extremely cathartic experience for the reader, as many questions we have been wondering for the entire part are answered in long and detailed segments, which fill in all of the missing pieces 
pieces leading up to Josuke's emergence from the ground at the beginning of the part, and how a fusion of two people could have possibly happened. So nearly every plot point, detail, and character, and fight that is connected to this larger mystery that has left us on the edge of our seats has been leading to this one moment. Which when revealed, is exciting and unexpected with so many oh shit moments that brings our protagonist's identity to a resolution that all exist within and reinforcing the part's theme. The arc begins with a narration from Yasuo telling the origin of the equivalent exchange fruit, being called the Rokakaka, or Lokakaka. It's sometimes spelled differently depending on the translation, and I'm not really sure the difference, but I usually refer to it as Rokakaka, as that's how it's most commonly translated. The fruit originated in the islands of Papua New Guinea and was first discovered by Australians in 1938, although the natives of Papua New Guinea have been around for over 50,000 years, and it's implied that the fruit has been a part of their culture for as long as they've existed. Although during the Second World War, when Japan began occupying half of New Guinea, reports of the Rokakaka faded into myth, which explains why few people know about the fruit and why certain people with its knowledge would want to keep it a secret, in order to exploit its healing powers for a financial gain. This arc begins proper back at the Higashikata home, when the eldest daughter Hato introduces her boyfriend to the family, who we already know is Damo Tamaki, using Hato in order to infiltrate the family home. Although when reading this for the first time, there's a thick tension in the air as Damo's design associates him with the rock humans. As well as upon his arrival, we see strange fingerprints appearing on whatever he touches, foreshadowing his stand ability. And after some awkward small talk, the members of the family begin getting picked off one by one, as Damo is secretly spreading his ability throughout the house, causing whoever comes in contact with his stand to become extremely soft, losing full control of their bodies and melting into piles of goo. Leading up to this moment, Josuke had asked Yasuo to look into Josefume Kujo, who we learned about in the last arc. She had found his ID and faxed it over to the Higashikata home, only to see that the man who has assumed Josefume's identity is in fact Damo Tamaki within the home, which is revealed simultaneously with his attack, which wasn't much of a twist from the reader's perspective, as we already saw his stance spreading, but still a cool reveal for a villain. Although it's never really explained why Damo's picture was on Josefume's family registry, although it's most likely to steal his identity, as rock humans often steal the identities of people they've killed, so he didn't mind telling the family his name was Damo if he planned to kill them anyways. Or it was some sort of intimidation technique, as Josefume's body was never found, so this was Damo letting Josefume know that they're looking for him. So while Damo is an incredibly threatening adversary who is meticulous and menacing with his attack on the family, what really makes this arc is the flashback happening in between moments of present day, which not only fully explains Josuke's origin, but also the motive behind the rock humans and why they've been tracking him down for the entire part. I'll pretty much recap the entire flashback here because I love talking about this scene, as well as within it, there are many details and a lot of symbolic imagery that will be relevant when further discussing Josuke's existence and his future abilities. It all begins two years before the events of Chapter 1, in 2009, where we see Kira Yoshikage, a ship doctor currently on board a cargo boat transporting goods from the islands of New Guinea to Japan. During the voyage, a crew member had fallen from top deck onto a cargo crate. Within the broken crate, Kira notices a bleeding rock, which appears to be a stone statue, but with blood dripping from its fractures. And we can see that the bleeding stone statue is the rock human Aisho who we encountered earlier, and that this accident was a result of his bad luck, a calamity caused by his negative flow. The bleeding rocks intrigue Kira, so he looks into the cargo's destination, which is the Higashikata fruit parlor, where he also finds on board there is some sort of fruit tree within the same shipment, and that this cargo has been delivered multiple times. When back in Japan, Kira stakes out the cargo container to see what happens, eventually seeing the statue come to life. He deduces that the rock-like skin is something different than a stand ability, but still abnormal. And because the fruit itself isn't illegal, wonders why anyone would go through the process of smuggling them into the country. Which leads Kira to believe that there must be something special about the fruit, and decides to steal one. It's around this time that Kira also runs into Joseph Fumi at a ramen shop and notices him using a stand ability, but he also recognizes him from his past, which leads us even further back in time, where we see Joseph Fume as a child, who almost drowned in the ocean as when he was swept away, his own mother hesitated to save his life. Although she eventually reached out for him, but too much time had passed and he was badly injured by the waves and rocks. When taken to the hospital, Joseph Fume is treated by Holly Kira, who asks her son Yoshikage to use his stand killer queen to clear a blood clot in Joseph Fume to save his life. This again alludes to the idea that Holly was a stand user, considering her child developed a stand at a young age and she was fully aware of its powers. This version of Killer Queen in Part A also works slightly different from its original, as it creates explosive bubbles which when popped will cause damage to the environments around them, and it still has its substand sheer heart attack, which now appears as a colony type stand which can change its size and create normal explosions, but also smaller, more controlled ones on even a microscopic level. But back in present day, Kira continues to 
Spy on Ice show as he sees a transaction where a baseball player buys a Rokakaka for an exorbitant amount of money, which heals his shoulder but turns his mouth to stone. This confirms Kira's suspicions of the fruit and its healing powers, which he plans to use in order to cure Holly of her mysterious illness, which she begins to develop around this time. At some point off screen, Kira becomes friends with Joseph Fume, and he trusts him enough to tell him about the fruit, and the two plan to steal one together. They decide that with their abilities, they would be able to steal the branches of the tree rather than a whole fruit, as it would be less suspicious, and they could even grow their own without the rock humans even knowing they've been stolen from. They plan to achieve this through the process of grafting branches. By using their stance together, they are able to create a situation which distracts Aisho, and they successfully steal the branches while replacing the stolen branches of the tree, and then they wait 9 months for their fruits to grow. Although just one week before the fruit is ripe for harvest, the two are ambushed by Damo Tamaki and the other rock humans which we had fought throughout the part. So Damo was already an intimidating villain in present day, albeit a little goofy looking, but still scary in the way he completely dominated a family of stand users with ease. And in this flashback, we see just how terrifying Damo truly is, as his group are intelligent and highly motivated, showing an incredible level of resourcefulness and attention to detail when it comes to their business. As Damo explains, they always weigh the Rokakaka tree before and after a trade to ensure nothing was stolen in transit or during the trade itself. They would have noticed if the weight was lower, but with the tree that Joseph Fume and Kira stole, it actually weighed slightly more. At first, Damo wasn't worried about this, and they chalked it up to more moisture in the pot or something. Although six months after the earthquake, the tree began to wilt, which revealed that two of the branches had been grafted. So the Damo group, for months, looked into every single injured and sick person in the entire nation of Japan, in order to find a motive and connection, where they eventually found Holly Kira suffering from an incurable disease, which led to her son Kira Yoshikage, the boat doctor who was on the same cargo ship as Aisho almost two years ago. And upon confirming this connection, the confrontation quickly turns into a stand battle, which showcases more of Damo's interrogation tactics, as it's mostly his dialogue which makes him such a well-written antagonist. In this scene, he takes a sort of responsibility for his negligence of exposing the fruit, and thus has a skewed sense of morality which results in him being what he considers fair, and lets one of the two live if they rat the other out. Although this was most likely a bluff, and was an interrogation practice to get someone to talk first. And it works, as Joseph Fume was moments away from folding on Kira because of his abandonment issues. So like many of the main villains in Jojo, Damo has a strong, authoritative presence and is able to react to any disruptions in his plans, and his character just feels very natural as a boss, being the leader of this group of rock humans. This fight eventually ends with Kira using Killer Queen to cause an explosion, which sweeps him and Joseph Fume into the sea and carries them closer to their grafted branches. Kira's injuries were much worse than Joseph Fume's, so he is force-fed the fruit, which causes a slightly different reaction than the normal Rokakaka, healing Kira's wounds by exchanging them with Joseph Fume's body. This new power was created because the tree the branches were grafted to were located on the blessed lands of Morio, making its power more similar to that of the Holy Corpse, exchanging damage or misfortune with someone else. This scene is particularly focused on Joseph Fume, who realizes the fruit's power and chooses to sacrifice himself for the sake of Kira and his mother, feeling like he owes them for saving his life, as well as that he has exceeded his allowed time on Earth, believing that he was fated to die that day on the beach, previously saying, I drowned, I didn't survive. From that day I went to the beach, I didn't exist anywhere at all. And upon accepting his fate in the image of happiness, an aftershock occurs, causing Kira and Joseph Fume to fall into the ground, with their bodies pressed against each other with the pressure of the blessed lands while undergoing an equivalent exchange, which then results in the birth of Josuke. Josuke being the miracle and the light casted by this overwhelming calamity. So with this knowledge, this completely recontextualized Josuke's character from his perspective as well as from a reader's, as we've already discussed the importance of existence within the world and how everything which exists is under heaven and earth, trapped within the flow of calamity and the logic of the world. Although through this miraculous sequence of events, Josuke, as mentioned by Araki in the author notes about the parts named Jojolian, makes Josuke more than just human, as he exists outside of heaven and earth, as he was never technically born, yet still exists in this world. As well as Joseph Fume had mentioned, he didn't really exist anywhere at all, which further vindicates Josuke's phenomenon of being able to surpass the flow of calamity, as he contradicts the world's logic, therefore exists outside of its logic. Joseph Fume and in turn Josuke are also depicted as Christ himself during this arc, as him and Holly are drawn replicating the Pieta by Michelangelo, a sculpture depicting the biblical scene of the Virgin Mary holding her dead son within her arms, symbolizing Josuke's blessed nature and rebirth, but also Holly's martyrdom being Our Lady of Sorrow, 
trapped in a constant state of pain and suffering throughout the story. So the reason why I hold this arc in such high regards is because I truly believe that this is the peak of Araki's storytelling, as in no other work has he ever done such a well job of intertwining the art, the action, and themes with its story, as every single character, fight, and plot point introduced up until this point was all connected to this arc. The Rock humans, Kiryoshi Kage, Johnny Joestar, the Walleyes, the Blessed Lands, Josuke of course, it was all set up for this moment of resolution, which was executed perfectly. Answering pretty much all of the burning questions up until this point, as well as allowing the reader to view the previous arcs in a completely new context, which adds even more depth when revisiting the story, as we now know Josuke's connection to the fruit, the rock humans, and Kiryoshi Kage. Even the imagery within this arc also expresses the miraculous nature of Josuke's existence through the process leading up to his creation, as the steps taken by Kira and Josefume in order to create the new fruit parallels their eventual fate of becoming one. As the new Rokakaka was created through the process of grafting branches, fusing two things together, and the grafted branches created a new fruit with a miraculous power due to the blessed lands, this being a representation of Josuke himself, a fusion of two people gifted with a new power being the miracle to surpass calamity. So now with the context of Kira and Josefume stands, we can further discuss Josuke's soft and wet, as its name and design are the same as Joseph Fume's stand, as Josuke's body is more Joseph Fume than it is Kira, although his stand is a fusion of their powers. Although up until this point, I simply described its ability as being able to plunder, taking physical and abstract properties away from people and objects, as well as it can use its soap bubbles to interact with the physical world. This ability now makes a bit more sense and reflects Josuke's character, as the things he takes with his soap bubble are temporarily removed from existence, as his soap bubbles exist outside of heaven and earth. This is similar to the stand's original ability of absorption, as Joseph Fume was able to absorb things with his soap bubbles, like the molecules of tree branches and replacing them, allowing him to graft the branches. Although he was never able to remove things to the extent of Josuke, who can literally erase things out of existence. The new soft and wet also contains properties of Kira's exploding bubbles, although this isn't something Josuke seems to be aware of for a majority of the part, as whenever he uses its power, it seems to be on accident. Like when his bubbles popped on Damo's glasses with a micro explosion causing them to break, and Damo reflects that this is similar to Kira's power. And later during the urban gorilla fight, he fully uses Kira's bomb ability, but doesn't even seem to notice that it was him who caused the explosion. So soft and wet in its new form is a great reflection of Josuke as a character, as he is the physical body of two people who have their influences in his stand, but he's ultimately his own person. Therefore, he has an ability completely unique to himself. That's a representation of his miraculous nature and his experiences. So following this flashback, sequence, this brings us to the end of the arc, as Josuke and Hato, being the last remaining family members, work together to finally stop Damo, which reveals Hato's stand, Walking Heart, being able to extend the heels of her shoes into sharp spikes that are able to pierce through solid rock. This is sort of an emotional scene for Hato, as she has to kill her boyfriend in order to save her family, as she is full of tears. But honestly, it doesn't really hit too hard, as up until this point, we really haven't spent enough or any time with Hato for the readers to be invested in her character and emotions. But it is still a nice moment to see Hato actually do something something as she is able to overcome and strike down Damo while saving her family. Although it is still Josuke who deals the finishing blow, as he chases Damo out of the house and strikes him down without any hesitation in the middle of the streets, turning him to crumbling stone. So by the end of this arc, it almost feels like a conclusion to the story, and in some ways it is, as Jojolian has a very clearly defined first and second half, which is the reason why it's the longest part of Jojo, pretty much telling two stories within the same part. The first of which being Josuke's journey to find his identity identity in enacting retribution on those from his past lives. But moving forward, he now needs to decide what he wants to do with this life, who his family is, what's important to him, and what's worth fighting for. Leading into the second half, now that the Damokan group have been eliminated, the only remaining threat in the story is Jobin Higashikata, who had ties to the Damo group and was disappointed after hearing about their defeat, setting him up in a more antagonistic role moving forward. As well as within the same chapter is the release of Kato Higashikata from prison, the mother of the family. Family, being aligned as an ally to Jobin, as he was the first family member she contacted when she was released. As well as through her dialogue of claiming to take her life back and throwing away her wedding ring, she is also pitted against the family, similarly to Jobin. But we'll delve more into their shared natures and roles in the second half. So to further define the two halves of Jojolian, following Vitamin C is a sort of interlude arc being the Milagro Man, which allows the part to momentarily step away from Josuke and tell a self-contained story following Joshu Higashikata two weeks before the events of Vitamin C. This arc is completely separate from the larger plot of Jojolian and reads more like a rocky spin 
spin-off series Thus Spoke Rohan Kashibe, which explores more elements of folklore and the supernatural. Although the overall theme of the Milagro Man, being miracles and curses, does justify its inclusion in the part and isn't completely unrelated. Up until this point, we have seen the greed exuded from Joshu as he is bribed by his father and tries to exploit Josuke's Shakedown Road in the pursuit to shortcut his way to wealth. And during this arc, Joshu is burdened with the curse of the Milagro Man. Milagro meaning miracle in Spanish, so also known as the Miracle Man. The effects of the curse will result in a rapid accumulation of money, as no matter how or where you try to spend money, it will always be returned to you with interest, which appears similar to being placed within a positive flow in life, as it will not control others, but it will affect their fates, which results in the money being returned. While experiencing these effects, Joshu quickly learns that having money can sometimes be more of a negative than a positive, and the weight of the Milagro curse literally starts to weigh him down, and he begins to appreciate the sentiment of spending money for its purpose rather than hoarding as much as he can. As there's more to life and a better life to lead when you're not completely focused on money. The way this ability works provides some insight on how curses can manifest and attach themselves to people and objects, as the origin of the Milagro Man was a sin committed by someone long in the past, an arms dealer who had made their wealth by fueling the war economy, although eventually faced a lawsuit resulting in damages of $50 billion. Faced with this debt, the arms dealer killed his entire family and himself, creating the Milagro Curse, which attached itself to one of the dollar bills burning in the same fire that killed the user, and would be passed on through the years, cursing anyone who would happen to steal money created by the Milagro Man. So the Milagro Man is a stand, but with no user, its ability is more appropriately defined as a curse. As there's no way to definitively overcome its power, as if you want to be free, you need to exchange the curse with someone else. So this Milagro Curse may provide insight into the Higashikata Curse, as throughout all of Jojolian, its origin is never revealed. So it could be that there was a sin committed by a long distant Higashikata, who had done something so terrible it created a curse, which manifested as the power of the rock disease. Which may have even originated from a stand whose physical form has been lost to time, similarly to the Milagro Man. This arc ends with Joshu passing the curse back to the man whose money he stole in the beginning, teaching Joshu a lesson in greed and giving him a new perspective on the importance of money, which is a nice arc for the character, growing and becoming slightly more mature. And connecting back to the larger theme in Jojolian, the curse seemed to be a representation of the two flows in life, being a curse which grants miracles, with an ability that can be interpreted as both a blessing and a curse, gifting its user with an unlimited amount of money but with no way to spend it, placing the target somewhere in a limbo in between the positive and negative flow. And that brings us to the conclusion of the first half of Jojolian, a story about calamity, identity, and miracles, coalescing within a singular flow that explores the mystery of a man who came from the ground. Be sure to join me in part two of this retrospective, which will conclude the story of Jojolian and Josuke's journey to overcome the power of calamity itself. Thank you all so much for watching. I hope this video allowed you to view Jojolian in a new light and gained a new perspective and deeper appreciation for its story. Be sure to like the video if you enjoyed or if you just made it to the end and subscribe for future Jojo and the Jojo Lands content.